Henry V by William Shakespeare. Prologue. Enter chorus. O oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine sword and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, gentles all, the flat unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? O oh, pardon, since a crooked figure may attest in little place a million, and let us ciphers to this great accompt on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies, whose high uprearied and abutting fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Peace out our imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide one man, and make imaginary puissance. Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hoofs o' the receiving earth, for tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings, carry them here and there, jumping o'er times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hour-glass. For the which supply, admit me chorus to this history, who, prologue-like, your humble patience pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge. Our play. Exit. Act One. Scene One. London. An antechamber in the King's Palace. Enter the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Bishop of Ely. My lord, I'll tell you that self bill is urged, which in the eleventh year of the last King's reign was like and had indeed against us past, but that the scambling and unquiet time did put it out of further question. But how, my lord, shall we resist it now? It must be thought on. If it pass against us, we lose the better half of our possession. For all the temporal lands which men devout by testament have given to the church, would they strip from us, being valued thus, as much as would maintain to the king's honour full fifteen earls and fifteen hundred knights, six thousand and two hundred good esquires, and to a leaf of lazars and weak age of indigent faint souls past corporal toil a hundred almshouses right well supplied and to the coffers of the king beside a thousand pounds by the year thus runs the bill this would drink deep twould drink the cup and all but what prevents him the king is full of grace and fair regard and a true lover of the holy church the courses of his youth promised it not the breath no sooner left his father's body, but that his wildness, mortified in him, seemed to die too. Yea, at that very moment, consideration, like an angel, came, and whipped the offending Adam out of him, leaving his body as a paradise, to envelop and contain celestial spirits. Never was such a sudden scholar made, never came reformation in a flood with such a heady currents scouring faults nor never hydra-headed wilfulness so soon did lose his seat and all at once as in this king we are blessed in the change hear him but reason in divinity and all admiring with an inward wish you would desire the king were made a prelate hear him debate of commonwealth affairs you would say it hath been all in all his study list his discourse of war and you shall hear a fearful battle rendered you in music. Turn him to any cause of policy. The Gordian knot of it he will unloose, familiar as his garter. That, when he speaks the air, a chart of the libertine is still, and the mute wonder locate in men's ears. 
to steal his sweet and honeyed sentences, so that the art and practic part of life must be the mistress to this theoric, which is a wonder how his grace should glean it, since his addiction was to cause his vein, his companies unlettered, rude and shallow, his hours filled up with riots, banquets, sports, I never noted in him any study, any retirement, any sequestration from open haunts and popularity. The strawberry grows underneath the nettle, and wholesome berries thrive and ripen best, neighboured by fruit of baser quality. And so the prince obscured his contemplation under the veil of wildness, which, no doubt, grew like the summer grass, fastest by night, unseen, yet crescive in his faculty. It must be so, for miracles are ceased, and therefore we must needs admit the means how things are perfected. But, my good lord, how now for mitigation of this bill urged by the commons? Doth his majesty incline to it, or no? He seems indifferent, or rather swaying more upon our part than cherishing the exhibitors against us, for I have made an offer to his majesty upon our spiritual convocation, and in regard of causes now in hand which I have opened to his grace at large, as touching France, to give a greater sum than ever at one time the clergy yet did to his predecessors part with all. How did this offer seem received, my lord? With good acceptance of his majesty, save that there was not time enough to hear, as I perceived his grace would fain have done, the severals and unhidden passages of his true titles to some certain dukedoms and generally to the crown and seat of france derived from edward his great-grandfather what was the impediment that broke this off the french ambassador upon that instant craved audience and the hour i think is come to give him hearing is it four o'clock it is then go we in to know his embassy which i could with a ready guess declare before the frenchman speak a word of it i'll wait upon you and i long to hear it exeunt scene two the same the presence chamber Enter King Henry V, Gloucester, Bedford, Exeter, Warwick, Westmoreland, and attendants. Where is my gracious lord of Canterbury? Not here in presence. Send for him, good uncle. Shall we call in the ambassador, my liege? Not yet, my cousin. We would be resolved, before we hear him, of some things of weight that task our thoughts concerning us and France. Enter the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Bishop of Ely. God and his angels guard your throne, and make you long become it. Sure, we thank you. My learned lord, we pray you to proceed, and justly and religiously unfold, why the law salic that they have in France, or should or should not, bar us in our claim. And God forbid, my dear and faithful lord, that you should fashion, rest, or bow your reading, or nicely charge your understanding soul with opening titles miscreate, whose right suits not in native colours with the truth. For God doth know how many now in health shall drop their blood in approbation of what your reverence shall incite us to. Therefore take heed how you impawn our person, how you awake our sleeping sword of war. We charge you in the name of God take heed, for never two such kingdoms did contend without much fall of blood, whose guiltless drops are every one a woe, a sore complaint, gainst him whose wrong gives edge unto the swords, that make such waste in brief mortality. Under this conjuration speak, my lord, for we will hear, note, and believe in heart, that what you speak is in your conscience washed as pure as sin with baptism. Then hear me, gracious sovereign, and you peers that owe yourselves, your lives, and services to this imperial throne. There is no bar to make against your highness' claim to France, but this, which they produce from Faramund. In terram salicam mulieres ne succedant, no woman shall succeed in salic land, which salic land the French unjustly glows to be the realm of France, and Faraman, the founder of this law and female bar. Yet their own authors faithfully affirm that the land salic is in Germany, between the floods of Sulla and of Elbe, where Charles the Great, having subdued the Saxons, there left behind and settled certain French, who, holding in disdain the German women for some dishonest manners of their life, established then this law, to wit, 
no female should be in Hedrix in Salic land. Which Salic, as I said, twixt Elbe and Sala, is at this day in Germany called Meissen. Then doth it well appear that Salic law was not devised for the realm of France, nor did the French possess the Salic land until four hundred and one and twenty years after defunction of King Faramand. Idly suppose the founder of this law, who died within the year of our redemption four hundred twenty six, and Charles the Great subdued the Saxons, and did seat the French beyond the river Sala in the year eight hundred five. Besides, their writers say, King Pepin, which deposed Childric, did, as heir general, being descended of Blithild, daughter of King Clothair, make claim and title to the crown of France. Hugh Capet also, who usurped the crown of Charles, the Duke of Lorraine, sole heir male of the true line and stock of Charles the Great, to find his title with some shows of truth. Through impure truth it was corrupt, and naught conveyed himself as heir to the Lady Lingar, daughter to Charlemagne, who was the son to Louis the Emperor and Louis the son of Charles the Great, also King Louis the Tenth, who was sole heir to the usurper Capet, could not keep quiet in his conscience wearing the crown of France, till satisfied that fair Queen Isabel, his grandmother, was lineal of the Lady Lingar, daughter to Charles the foresaid Duke of Lorraine, by the which marriage the lion of Charles the Great was reunited to the crown of France, so that as clear is the summer's sun, King Pepin's title and Hugh Cabot's claim, King Louis his satisfaction, all appear to hold in right and title of the female. So do the kings of France unto this day, how beat they will hold up this sonic law to bar your highness claiming from the female, and rather choose to hide them in a net than amply to embar their crooked titles, usurped from you and your progenitors. May I with right and conscience make this claim? The sin upon my head, dread sovereign, for in the book of numbers is it writ that when the man dies, let the inheritance descend unto the daughter. Gracious Lord, stand for your own, and wind your bloody flag, look back into your mighty ancestors. Go, my dread lord, to your great grandsire's tomb from whom you claim, invoke his warlike spirit, and your great uncle's Edward, the Black Prince who, on the French ground, played a tragedy, making defeat on the full power of France, whilst his most mighty father on a hill stood smiling to behold his lion's whelp, forage in blood of French nobility. O oh, noble English that could entertain with half their forces the full pride of France, and let another half stand laughing by, all out of work and cold for action. Awake, remembrance of these valiant dead, and with your puissant arm renew their feats. You are their heir, you sit upon their throne. The blood and courage that renowned them runs in your veins, and my thrice puissant liege is in a very May morn of his youth, ripe for exploits and mighty enterprises. Your brother kings and monarchs of the earth do all expect that you should rouse yourself as did the former lions of your blood. They know your grace hath cause and means and might. So hath your highness. Never king of England had nobles richer and more loyal subjects, whose hearts have left their bodies here in England and lie pavilioned in the fields of France. Oh, let their bodies follow, my dear liege with blood and sword and fire to win your right, in aid whereof we of the spirituality will raise your highness such a mighty sum as never did the clergy at one time bring it to any of your ancestors. We must not only arm to invade the French, but lay down our proportions to defend against the Scot, who will make road upon us with all advantages. They of those marches, gracious sovereign, shall be a wall sufficient to defend our inland from the pilfering borderers. We do not mean the coursing snatchers only, but fear the main intendment of the Scot, who hath been still a giddy neighbour to us. For you shall read that my great-grandfather never went with his forces into France, but that the Scot on his unfurnished kingdom came pouring, like the tide into a breach, with ample and brim fullness of his force, galling the gleaned land with hot assays, girding with grievous siege castles and towns, that England, being empty of defence, hath shook and trembled at the ill neighbourhood. She hath been then more feared than harmed, my liege, for here are but exampled by herself, when all her chivalry hath been in France, 
and she a mourning widow of her nobles, she hath herself not only well defended, but taken and impounded as a stray the King of Scots, whom she did send to France, to fill King Edward's fame with prisoner kings, and make her chronicle as rich with praise as is the ooze and bottom of the sea, with sunken wreck and sunless treasuries. But this is saying, very old and true, if that you will France win, then with Scotland first begin, for once the eagle England being in prey, to her unguarded nest the weasel Scot comes sneaking, and so sucks her princely eggs, playing the mouse in the absence of the cat, to tear and havoc more than she can eat. It follows, then, the cat must stay at home. Yet that is but a crushed necessity, since we have locks to safeguard necessaries, and pretty traps to catch the petty thieves. While that the armed hand doth fight abroad, the advised head defends itself at home. For government, though high and low and lower, put into parts, doth keep in one consent, congreeing in a full and natural close, like music. Therefore doth heaven divide the state of man in divers functions setting endeavour in a continual motion, to which is fixed as a name or but obedience. For so work the honey-bees, creatures that by a rule in nature teach the act of order to a peopled kingdom. They have a king and officers of sorts, where some like magistrates correct at home, others like merchants venture trade abroad, others like soldiers armed in their stings, make boot upon the summer's velvet buds, which pillage they, with merry march bring home to the tent royal of their emperor who busied in his majesty surveys the singing masons building roofs of gold the civil citizens kneading up the honey the poor mechanic porters crowding in their heavy burdens at his narrow gate the sad-eyed justice with his surly hum delivering o'er to executors pale the lazy yawning drum i this infer that many things, having full reference to one consent, may work contrariously, as many arrows loosed in several ways come to one mark, as many ways meet in one town, as many fresh streams meet in one salt sea, as many lines close in the dial centre, so may a thousand actions once afoot end in one purpose, and be all well born without defeat. Therefore to France, my liege, divide your happy England into four, whereof take you one quarter into France, and you withal shall make all Gallia shake. If we, with thrice such powers, left at home, cannot defend our own doors from the dog, let us be worried, and our nation lose the name of hardiness and policy. Call in the messengers sent from the Dauphin. Exeunt some attendants. Now are we well resolved and by god's help and yours the noble sinews of our power france being ours we'll bend it to our oar or break it all to pieces or there we'll sit ruling in large and ample empery or france and all her almost kingly dukedoms or lay these bones in an unworthy urn tombless with no remembrance over them either our history shall with full mouth speak freely of our acts or else our grave like turkish mute shall have a tongueless mouth, not worshipped with a waxen epitaph. Enter ambassadors of France. Now are we well prepared to know the pleasure of our fair cousin Dauphin, for we hear your greeting is from him, not from the king. It please your majesty to give us leave freely to render what we have in charge, or shall we sparingly show you far off the Dauphin's meaning and our embassy? We are no tyrant, but a Christian king under whose grace our passion is as subject as are our wretches fettered in our prisons. Therefore, with frank and with uncurbed plainness, tell us the Dauphin's mind. Thus, then, in few, your highness, lately sending into France, did claim some certain dukedoms in the right of your great predecessor, King Edward the Third. in answer of which claim the prince, our master, says that you savour too much of your youth, and bids you be advised, there's not in France that can be with a nimble galliard one. You cannot revel into dukedoms there. He therefore sends you metre for your spirit, this tune of treasure, and, in lieu of this, desires you let the dukedoms that you claim hear no more of you. This, 
The Dauphin speaks. What treasure, uncle? Tennis balls, my liege. We are glad the Dauphin is so pleasant with us. His present and your pains we thank you for. When we have marched our rackets to these balls, we will in France, by God's grace, play a set shall strike his father's crown into the hazard. Tell him he hath made a match with such a wrangler that all the courts of France will be disturbed with chases. And we understand him well, how he comes o'er us with our wilder days, not measuring what use we made of them. We never valued this poor seat of England, and therefore, living hence, did give ourselves to barbarous license, as tis ever common that men are merriest when they are from home. But tell the Dauphin I will keep my state, be like a king, and show my sale of greatness when I do rouse me in my throne of France. For that I have laid by my majesty, and plodded like a man for working days. But I will rise there, with so full a glory that I will dazzle all the eyes of France, yea, strike the Dauphin blind to look on us. And tell this pleasant prince, this mock of his hath turned his balls to gunstones, and his soul shall stand sore charged for the wasteful vengeance that shall fly with them. For many a thousand widows shall this his mock mock out of their dear husbands, mock mothers from their sons, mock castles down, and some are yet ungotten and unborn that shall have cause to curse the Dauphin's scorn. But this lies all within the will of God, to whom I do appeal, and in whose name tell you the Dauphin I am coming on, to venge me as I may, and to put forth my rightful hand in a well-hallowed cause. So get you hence in peace, and tell the Dauphin his jest will savour but of shallow wit, when thousands weep more than did laugh at it. Convey them with safe conduct, fare you well. Exeunt ambassadors. This was a merry message. We hope to make the sender blush at it. Therefore, my lords, omit no happy hour that may give furtherance to our expedition, for we have now no thought in us but France save those to God that run before our business. Therefore let our proportions for these wars be soon collected, and all things thought upon that may with reasonable swiftness add more feathers to our wings. For, God before, we'll chide this Dauphin at his father's door. Therefore let every man now task his thought, that this fair action may on foot be brought. Exeunt. Flourish. End of Act One. Act Two. Prologue. Enter Chorus. Now all the youth of England are on fire, and silken dalliance in the wardrobe lies. Now thrive the armourers, and honour's thought reigns solely in the breast of every man. They sell the pasture now to buy the horse, following the mirror of all Christian kings, with winged heels as English mercuries. For now sits expectation in the air, and hides a sword from hilts unto the point with crowns imperial, crowns and coronets, promised to Harry and his followers. The French, advised by good intelligence of this most dreadful preparation, shake in their fear, and with pale policy seek to divert the English purposes. O oh, England, model to thy inward greatness, like little body with a mighty heart! What mightst thou do that honour would thee do, were all thy children kind and natural? But see thy fault! France hath in thee found out a nest of hollow bosoms, which he fills with treacherous crowns, and three corrupted men, one Richard, Earl of Cambridge, and the second Henry, Lord Scroop of Masham, and the third Sir Thomas Grey, Knight of Northumberland, have, for the guilt of France, O oh, guilt indeed, 
confirmed conspiracy with fearful France, and by their hands this grace of kings must die, if hell and treason hold their promises, ere he take ship for France and in Southampton. Linger your patience on, and will digest the abuse of distance, force a play. The sum is paid, the traitors are agreed, the king is set from London, and the scene is now transported, gentles, to Southampton. There is the playhouse, there must you sit, and thence to France shall we convey you safe and bring you back, charming the narrow seas to give you gentle pass. For if we may, we'll not offend one stomach with our play. But till the king come forth, and not till then, unto Southampton do we shift our scene. Exit. Scene one, London, a street. Enter Corporal Nim and Lieutenant Bardolph. Well met, Corporal Nim. Good morrow, Lieutenant Bardolph. What, our ancient pistol and new friends yet? For my part, I care not. I say little, but when time shall serve, there shall be smiles, but that shall be as it may. I dare not fight, but I will wink and hold out mine iron. It is a simple one, but what though? It will toast cheese, and it will endure cold as another man's sword will, and there's an end. I will bestow a breakfast to make you friends, and will be all three sworn brothers to France. Let it be so, good Corporal Nim faith i will live so long as i may that's certain of it and when i cannot live any longer i will do as i may that is my rest that is the rendezvous of it it is certain corporal that he is married to nell quickly and certainly she did you wrong for you were trough plight to her i cannot tell things must be as they may men may sleep and they may have their throats about them at that time and some say knives have edges it must be as it may. Though patience be a tired mare, yet she will plod. There must be conclusions. Well, I cannot tell. Enter Pistol and Hostess. Here comes ancient Pistol and his wife. Good Corporal, be patient here. How now, mine host, Pistol? By Tyke, call'st thou me host? Now, by this hand, I swear, I scorn the term. Nor shall my nail keep lodges. No, by my troth, not long for we cannot lodge and board a dozen or fourteen gentlewomen that live honestly by the prick of their needles, but it will be thought we keep a boardy-house straight. Nim and Pistol draw. Oh, well-a-day, lady, if he be not drawn now! We shall see wilful adultery and murder committed. Good lieutenant, good corporal, offer nothing here. Pish! Pish for thee, Iceland dog, thou pricky and cur of Iceland! Oh, good corporal Nim! Show thy valour, and put up your sword. Will you shog off? I will have you solace. Solace, egregious dog? O oh, viper vile! The solace in thy most marvellous face, the solace in thy teeth, and in thy throat, and in thy hateful lungs, yea, in thy maw, purdy, and, which is worse, within thy nasty mouth. I do retort the solace in thy bowels, for I can take and Pistol's cock is up, and flashing fire will follow. I'm not Barbazan. You cannot conjure me. I have an humour to knock you indifferently well. If you grow foul with me, Pistol, I will scour you with my rapier, as I may in fair terms. If you would walk off, I would prick your guts a little in good terms, as I may, and that's the humour of it. Oh, braggart vile, and damned furious white, the grave doth gape, and doting death is near, therefore exhale. Hear me, hear me what I say. He that strikes the first stroke, I'll run him up to the hilts as I am a soldier. Draws. An oath of mickle might, and fury shall abate. Give me thy fist, thy forefoot to me give. Thy spirits are most tall. I will cut thy throat one time or other in fair terms. That is the humour of it. Couple a gorge. That's the word. I thee defy again. O hound of Crete, think'st thou my spouse to get? No, to the spit will go, and from the powdering keg of infamy fetch forth the lazar kite of Cressid's kind. Doll tear sheet she by name, and her espouse. 
I have, and I will hold, the quondam quickly, for the only she, and, Pauka, there's enough. Go. Enter the boy. Mine has pistol. You must come to my master, and you has this. He's very sick, and all to bed. Good bottles, put thy face between his shits, and do the huffies of a warning pan. Faith, he's very hell. Away, you rogue. By my troth, he'll yield the crow a pudding one of these days. Ah, oh, the king has killed his art. Good husband, come home presently. Exeunt hostess and boy. Come, shall I make you two friends? We must to France together. Why the devil should we keep knives to cut one another's throats? Let floods or swell, and fiends for food hail on. You'll pay me the eight shillings I won of you at betting. Base is the slave that pays. That now I will have, that's the humour of it. As manhood shall compound, push home. They draw. By this sword, he that makes the first thrust, I'll kill him. By this sword, I will. Sword is an oaf, and oafs must have their course. Corporal Nim, and thou wilt be friends, be friends, and thou wilt not. Why, then, be enemies with me too? Prithee, put up. I shall have my eight shillings, I one of you at betting. A noble shalt thou have, and present pay. A liquor likewise will I give to thee, and friendship shall combine, and brotherhood. I'll live by Nim, and Nim shall live by me. Is this not just? For I shall subtler be unto the camp, and profits will accrue. Give me thy hand. I shall have my noble. In cash most justly paid. Well, then, that's the humour oft. Re-enter hostess. As ever ye came a women, come in quickly to Sir John. Ah, oh, poor art! He is so shaked of a burning quotidian tertian, that it is most lamentable to be old. Sweet men, come to him. The king hath run bad humours on the night. That's the even of it. Nim, thou hast spoke the right. His heart is fractured and corroborate. The king is a good king. But it must be as it may, he passes some humours and careers. Let us condole the night. For lambkins, we will live. Scene two. Southampton. A council chamber. Enter Exeter, Bedford, and Westmoreland. For God, his grace is bold to trust these traitors. They shall be apprehended by and by. How smooth and even they do bear themselves, as if allegiance in their bosoms sat, crowned with faith and constant loyalty. The king hath note of all that they intend by interception which they dream not of. Nay, but the man that was his bedfellow, whom he hath dulled and cloyed with gracious favours that he should for a foreign purse so sell his sovereign's life to death and treachery trumpet sound enter king henry v scroop cambridge gray and attendants now sits the wind fair and we will aboard my lord of cambridge and my kind lord of masham and you my gentle knight give me your thoughts Think you not that the powers we bear with us will cut their passage through the force of France, doing the execution and the act for which we have in head assembled them? No doubt, my liege, if each man do his best. I doubt not that. Since we are well persuaded, we carry not a heart with us from hence that grows not in a fair consent with ours, nor leave not one behind that doth not wish success and conquest to attend on us. Never was monarch better feared and loved than is your majesty. There's not, I think, a subject that sits in heart grief and uneasiness under the sweet shade of your government. True, those who are your father's enemies have steeped their galls in honey, and who serve you with hearts create of duty and of zeal. We therefore have great cause of thankfulness, and shall forget the office of our hand sooner than quittance of desert and merit, according to the weight and worthiness. So service shall with steeled sinews toil, and labour shall refresh itself with hope to do your grace incessant services. We judge no less. Uncle of Exeter, enlarge the man committed yesterday that railed against our person. We consider it was excess of wine that set him on, and on his more advice we pardon him. That's mercy, but too much security. Let him be punished, sovereign. 
lest example breed by his sufferance more of such a kind o oh, let us yet be merciful so may your highness and yet punish too sir you show great mercy if you give him life after the taste of much correction alas your too much love and care of me are heavy orisons gainst this poor wretch if little faults proceeding on distemper shall not be winked at how shall we stretch our eye when capital crimes chewed swallowed and digested appear before us we'll yet enlarge that man though cambridge scroop and gray in their dear care and tender preservation of our person would have him punished and now to our french causes who are the late commissioners i won my lord your highness bade me ask for it to-day so did you me my liege and i my royal sovereign then richard earl of cambridge there is yours there yours lord scroop of masham and sir knight grey of northumberland this same is yours read them and know i know your worthiness my lord of westmoreland and uncle exeter we will aboard to-night why how now gentlemen what see you in those papers that you lose so much complexion look ye how they change their cheeks are paper why what read you there that hath so cowarded and chased your blood out of appearance i do confess my fault but do submit me to your highness's mercy to which we all appeal the mercy that was quick in us but late by your own counsel is suppressed and killed you must not dare for shame to talk of mercy for your own reasons turn into your bosoms as dogs upon their masters worrying you see you my princes and my noble peers these english monsters my lord of cambridge here you know how apt our love was to accord to furnish him with all appurtenance belonging to his honour and this man hath for a few light crowns lightly conspired and sworn upon the practices of france to kill us here in hampton to the which this knight no less for bounty bound to us than cambridge's hath likewise sworn but oh what shall i say to thee lord scroop thou cruel ingrateful savage and inhuman creature thou that didst bear the key of all my counsels thou knewest the very bottom of my soul that almost might have coined me into gold wouldst thou have practised on me for thy use may it be possible that foreign hire could out of thee extract one spark of evil that might annoy my finger tis so strange that though the truth of it stands off as gross as black and white my eye will scarcely see it treason and murder ever kept together as two yoke devils sworn to either's purpose working so grossly in a natural cause that admiration did not hoop at them but thou gainst all proportion didst bring in wonder to wait on treason and on murder and whatsoever cunning fiend it was that wrought upon thee so preposterously hath got the voice in hell for excellence all other devils that suggest by treasons do botch and bungle up damnation with patches colours and with forms being fetched from glistering semblances of piety but he that tempered thee bade thee stand up gave thee no instance why thou shouldst do treason unless to dub thee with the name of traitor if that same demon that hath gulled thee thus should with his lion gait walk the whole world he might return to vasty tartar back and tell the legions i can never win a soul so easy as that englishman's oh how hast thou with jealousy infected the sweetness of affiance show men dutiful why so didst thou seem they grave and learned why so didst thou come they of noble family why so didst thou seem they religious why so didst thou or are they spare in diet free from gross passion or of mirth or anger constant in spirit not swerving with the blood garnished and decked in modest compliment not working with the eye without the ear and but in perjured judgment trusting neither such and so finely bolted didst thou seem and thus thy fall hath left a kind of blot to mark the full-fraught man and best endued with some suspicion 
I will weep for thee. For this revolt of thine, methinks, is like another fool of man. Their faults are open. Arrest them to the answer of the law, and God acquit them of their practices. I arrest thee of high treason, by the name of Richard, Earl of Cambridge. I arrest thee of high treason, by the name of Henry, Lord Scroope of Masham. I arrest thee of high treason, by the name of Thomas Gray, Knight of Northumberland. Our purposes God justly hath discovered, and I repent my fault more than my death, which I beseech your highness to forgive, although my body pay the price of it. For me the gold of France did not seduce, although I did admit it as a motive the sooner to effect what I intended. But God be thanked for prevention, which I in sufferance heartily will rejoice, beseeching God and you to pardon me. Never did faithful subject more rejoice at the discovery of the most dangerous treason than I do at this hour joy or myself, prevented from a damned enterprise, my fault, but not my body. Pardon, sovereign. God quit you in his mercy. Hear your sentence. You have conspired against our royal person, joined with an enemy proclaimed, and from his coffers received the golden earnest of our death, wherein you would have sold your king to slaughter, his princes and his peers to servitude, his subjects to oppression and contempt, and his whole kingdom into desolation. Touching our person seek we no revenge, but we our kingdom's safety must so tender whose ruin you have sought, that to her laws we do deliver you. Get you therefore hence, poor miserable wretches, to your death, the taste whereof, God of his mercy, give you patience to endure, and true repentance of all your dear offences. Bear them hence. Exeunt Cambridge, Scroop, and Grey, guarded. Now, lords for France, the enterprise whereof shall be to you as us like glorious. We doubt not of a fair and lucky war, since God so graciously hath brought to light this dangerous treason lurking in our way to hinder our beginnings. We doubt not now, but every rub is smoothed on our way. Then forth, dear countrymen, let us deliver our puissance into the hand of God, putting it straight in expedition. Cheerly to see, the signs of war advance, no king of England, if not king of France. Exeunt. Scene three. London, before a tavern. Enter Pistol, Hostess, Nim, Bardolph, and Boy. Prithee, honey sweet husband, let me bring thee to Staines. No, for my manly heart doth yearn. Bardolph, be blithe. Nim, rouse thy vaunting veins. Boy, bristle thy courage up, for Falstaff he is dead, and we must yearn therefore. Would I were with him where Samaria is, either in heaven or in hell. Nay, sure, he's not in hell. He's in Arthur's bosom, if ever man went to Arthur's bosom. He made a finer end, and went away, and it had been any chrism child. A parted even just between twelve and one even at the turning of the tide. For after I saw him fumble with the sheets, and play with flowers, and smile upon his fingers' ends, I knew that was but one way, for his nose was as sharp as a pen, and a babble to green fields. "'How oh, now, Sir John,' quoth I, "'what man, be a good cheer!' So he cried out, "'God, God, God!' three or four times. Now I, to comfort him, bid him I should not think of God. I hope there was no need to trouble himself with any such thoughts yet. So a bad me lay more clothes on his feet. I put my hand into the bed and felt them, and they were as cold as any stone. Then I felt to his knees, and they were as cold as any stone, and so upward and upward, and all was as cold as any stone. They say he cried out of sack. Aye, that he did. And of women? 
nay, that I did not. Yes, that I did. And say the word devils incarnate. I never could abide carnation. Twas a colour he never liked. He said once, the devil would have him about women. It did in some sort, indeed, and women. But then he was rheumatic and talked to the horror Babylon. Do you not remember? A so a fleece stick up in Bottle's nose, and said it was a black soul burning in hell fire. Well, the fuel is gone that maintained that fire. That's all the riches I got in his service. Shall we shog? The king will be gone from Southampton. Come, let's away. My love, give me thy lips. Look to my chattels and my movables. Let senses rule. The word is pitch and pay. Trust none, for oaths are straws, men's faiths are wafer cakes, and hold fast is the only dog, my duck. Therefore, Cavito be thy counsellor. Go, clear thy crystals. Yoke fellows in arms, let us to France. Like horse leeches, my boys, to suck, to suck, the very blood to suck. And that's. But an wholesome food to say. Touch her soft mouth and march. Farewell, hostess. Kissing her. I cannot kiss. That is the humour of it, but adieu. Let housewifery appear. Keep close, I thee command. Farewell. Adieu. Exeunt. Scene four. France. The King's Palace. Flourish. Enter the French King, the Dauphin, the Dukes of Berry and Bretagne, the Constable, and others. Thus comes the English with full power upon us, and more than carefully it us concerns to answer royally in our defences. Therefore the Dukes of Berry and of Bretagne, of Brabant and of Orléans shall make forth, and you, Prince Dauphin, with all swift dispatch, to line and new repair our towns of war with men of courage and with means defended. For England his approaches makes us fierce as waters to the sucking of a gulf. It fits us then to be as provident as fear may teach us out of late examples left by the fatal and neglected English upon our fields. My most redoubted father, it is most meet we arm us against the foe, for peace itself should not so dull a kingdom, though war nor no known quarrel were in question, but that defences, musters, preparations should be maintained, assembled, and collected, as were war in expectation. Therefore, I say it is meet we all go forth to view the sick and feeble parts of France, and let us do it with no show of fear, no, with no more than if we heard that England were busied with a Whitson Morris dance, for, my good liege, she is so idly kinged, her sceptre so fantastically borne by a vain, giddy, shallow, humorous youth, that fear attends her not. O oh, peace, Prince Dauphin! You are too much mistaken in this king. Question your grace the late ambassadors, with what great state he heard their embassy, how well supplied with noble counsellors, how modest in exception, and withal how terrible in constant resolution, and you shall find his vanities forespent were but the outside of the Roman Brutus, covering discretion with a coat of folly, as gardeners do with order hide those roots that shall first spring and be most delicate well tis not so my lord high constable but though we think it so it is no matter in cases of defence tis best to weigh the enemy more mighty than he seems so the proportions of defence are filled which of a weak or niggardly protection doth like a miser spoil his coat with scanting a little cloth think we king harry strong and princes look you strongly arm to meet him the kindred of him hath been fleshed upon us and he is bred out of that bloody strain that haunted us in our familiar paths witness our too much memorable shame when cressy battle fatally was struck and all our princes captive by the hand of that black name edward black prince of wales whiles that his mountain sire on mountain standing up in the air crowned with the golden sun saw his heroical seed and smiled 
to see him mangle the work of nature and deface the patterns that by God and by French fathers had twenty years been made. This is a stem of that victorious stock, and let us fear the native mightiness and fate of him. Enter a messenger. Ambassadors from Harry, King of England, do crave admittance to your majesty. We'll give them present audience. Go and bring them. Exeunt messenger and certain lords. You see, this chase is hotly followed, friends. Turn head and stop pursuit, for coward dogs most bend their mouth when what they seem to threaten runs far before them. Good my sovereign, take up the English short and let them know of what a monarchy you are the head. Self-love, my liege, is not so vile a sin as self-neglecting. Re-enter lords with Exeter and train. From our brother England? From him. And thus he greets your majesty. He wills you, in the name of God Almighty, that you divest yourself and lay apart the borrowed glories that by gift of heaven, by law of nature and of nations, long to him and to his heirs, namely, the crown and all wide-stretched honours that pertain, by custom and the ordinance of times, unto the crown of France, that you may know, tis no sinister nor no awkward claim picked from the wormholes of long-vanished days, nor from the dust of old oblivion raked, he sends you this most memorable line, in every branch truly demonstrative, willing to overlook this pedigree, and when you find him evenly derived from his most famed of famous ancestors, Edward the Third, he bids you then resign your crown and kingdom, indirectly held from him, the native and true challenger. Or else what follows? Bloody constraint. For if you hide the crown, even in your hearts, there will he rake for it. Therefore in fierce tempest is he coming, in thunder and in earthquake, like a Jove, that if requiring fail he will compel and bids you, in the bowels of the Lord, deliver up the crown, and to take mercy on the poor souls for whom this hungry war opens his vasty jaws, and on your head turning the widow's tears, the orphan's cries, the dead men's blood, the pining maiden's groans for husbands, fathers, and betrothed lovers that shall be swallowed in this controversy. This is his claim, his threatening, and my message. Unless the Dauphin be in presence here, to whom expressly I bring greeting too. For us we will consider of this further. Tomorrow shall you bear our full intent back to our brother England. For the Dauphin I stand here for him. What to him from England? Scorn and defiance, slight regard, contempt, and anything that may not misbecome the mighty sender doth he prize you at thus says my king and if your father's highness do not in grant of all demands at large sweeten the bitter mock you sent his majesty he'll call you to so hot an answer of it that caves and wombe voltages of france shall chide your trespass and return your mock in second accent of his ordinance say if my father render fair return it is against my will for I desire nothing but arts with England. To that end, as a matching to his youth and vanity, I did present him with the Paris bowls. He'll make your Paris Louvre shake for it, were it the mistress court of mighty Europe. And be assured you'll find a difference, as we his subjects have in wonder found, between the promise of his greener days and these he masters now. Now he weighs time even to the utmost grain. That you shall read in your own losses if he stay in France. Tomorrow shall you know our mind at full. Dispatch us with all speed, lest that our king come here himself to question our delay, for he is footed in this land already. You shall be soon dispatched with fair conditions. A night is but small breath and little pause to answer matters of this consequence. Flourish. Exeunt. End of Act Two. Act Three. Prologue. Enter Chorus.
Thus, with imagined wing, our swift scene flies in motion of no less celerity than that of thought. Suppose that you have seen the well-appointed king at Hampton Pier embark his royalty, and his brave fleet with silken streamers the young Phoebus fanning. Play with your fancies, and in them behold upon the hempen tackle ship-boys climbing. Hear the shrill whistle which doth order give to sounds confused. Behold the threaden sails, borne with the invisible and creeping wind, draw the huge bottoms through the furrowed sea, breasting the lofty surge. Oh, do but think you stand upon the ravage, and behold a city on the inconstant billows dancing. For so appears this fleet majestical, holding due course to Harfleur. Follow! Follow! Grapple your minds to sternage of this navy, and leave your England, as dead midnight still, guarded with grandsires, babies, and old women, either past or not arrived to pith and puissance. For who is he whose chin is but enriched with one appearing hair, that will not follow these culled and choice-drawn cavaliers to France? Work! Work your thoughts, and therein see a siege. Behold the ordnance on their carriages, with fatal mouths gaping on girded harfleur. Suppose the ambassador from the French comes back, tells Harry that the king doth offer him Catherine his daughter, and with her to dowry some petty and unprofitable dukedoms. The offer likes not, and the nimble gunner with linstock now the devilish cannon touches. And down goes all before them. Still be kind, and eke out our performance with your mind. Exit. Scene one, France, before Harfleur. Alarum. Enter King Henry, Exeter, Bedford, Gloucester, and soldiers with scaling ladders. Once more into the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. In peace there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard-favoured rage. Then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow o'erwhelm it as fearfully as doth a galled rock, or hang and jutty his confounded base, swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide, hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. On, on, you noblest English, whose blood is fetched from fathers of war-proof. Fathers that, like so many Alexanders, have in these parts from morn till even fought, and sheathed their swords for lack of argument. Dishonour not your mothers. Now attest that those whom you called fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of grosser blood, and teach them how to war. And you, good yeomen, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not. For there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble lustre in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge cry God for Harry, England, and St. George. Exeunt. Alarum, and chambers go off. Scene two. The same. Enter Nim, Bardolph, Pistol, and Boy. On, 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 on! To the breach, to the breach! Prithee, Corporal, stay. The knocks are too hot. And for mine own part I have not a case of lives. The humour of it is too hot. That is the very plain song of it. The plain song is most just, for humours do abound. Knocks go and come. God's vessels drop and die, and sword and shield in bloody field doth win immortal fame. All thy woe in an hellious London, I will give all my fame for a boat of ale and safety. And I, 
if wishes would prevail with me my purpose would not fail with me but thither would i hie as judy but not as truly as boo doth think and feel enter fluellen up to the breach you dogs avaunt you cullions driving them forward be merciful great duke to men of mould abate thy rage abate thy manly rage abate thy rage great duke good boarcock bait thy rage use lenity sweet chuck these be good humours your honour wins bad humours exeunt all but boy as young as i am i have observed the three swooshes i am bowed to them all three but all the three though the wolf of me could not be mad to me though indeed three such antics do not amount to a man so battles he is white livered and red faced by the means whereof he faces it out that fights not for pistol he has a killing tongue and a quiet sword by the means whereof he breaks words and keeps who weapons or name he has heard that men of few words are the best men and therefore is come to say his prayers lest he shall be so a coward but his few bad words are matched with half few good deeds for never broke any man's head but the cone and that will gain the post when he was drank he will steal anything and call it purchase. Bottles, stole a loot case, buried twelve legs, and sold it for three half pounds. Name and bottles are sworn brothers in filching, and in Kelly, the stole a fire shovel. I knew by the piece of service the man will carry coal. The old have me a familiar with men's pockets, of their gloves and their handchurkers, which makes much against my manhood if I should take from hands of pockets to put into mine. For it is plain pocketing that was wrong. I must leave them and seek some better service. The villainy goes against my weak stomach, and therefore. I must cast it up. Exit. Re enter Fluellen, Gower following. Captain Fluellen, you must come presently to the mines. The Duke of Gloucester would speak with you. To the mines? Tell you the Duke, it is not so good to come to the mines. For look you, the mines is not according to the disciplines of the war. The concavities of it is not sufficient. For look you, the adversary you may discuss unto the duke look you is digged himself four yard under the countermines by chishu i think i will plough up all if there is not better directions the duke of gloucester to whom the order of the siege is given is altogether directed by an irishman a very valiant gentleman in faith it is captain macmorris is it not i think it be by chishu he is an ass as in the world i will verify as much in his beard he has no more directions in the true disciplines of the wars look you of the roman disciplines than is a puppy dog enter macmorris and captain jamie here he comes and the scots captain captain jamie with him captain jamie is a marvellous valorous gentleman that is certain and of great expedition and knowledge in the ancient wars upon my particular knowledge of his directions by chishu he will maintain his argument as well as any military man in the world in the disciplines of the pristine wars of the romans i say good day captain fluellen god den to your worship good captain james how now captain macmorris have you quit the mines have the pioneers given o'er by christ la tis ill done the work is give over the trumpets sound the retreat by my hand i swear on my father's soul the work is ill done 
It is give over. I would have blowed up the town, so Christ save me, la, in an hour. Oh, tis ill done, tis ill done. By my hand, tis ill done. Captain MacMorris, I beseech you now, will you vouchsafe me, look you, a few disputations with you, as partly touching or concerning the disciplines of the war, the Roman wars, in the way of argument, look you, and friendly communication, partly to satisfy my opinion, and partly for the satisfaction, look you, of my mind as touching the direction of the military discipline that is the point it shall be very good good faith good captain's baith and i shall quit you with good leave as i may pick occasion that shall i marry it is no time to discourse so christ save me the day is hot and the weather and the wars and the king and the dukes it is no time to discourse the town is besieged and the trumpet call us to the breach and we talk and be christ do nothing Tis shame for us all, so God save me, tis shame to stand still. It is shame by my hand, and there is throats to be cut, and work to be done, and there is nothing done, so Christ save me, la. By the mess, ere these eyes of mine take themselves to slumber, I'll do good service, or I'll liggy the ground for it. I or go to death, and I'll pate it as valorously as I may, that sal I surely do, that is the breath in the long. Marry, I would full fain hear some question tween you twa. Captain MacMorris, I think, look you, under your correction, there is not many of your nation. Of my nation? What is my nation? Is a villain and a bastard and a knave and a rascal? What is my nation? Who talks of my nation? Look you, if you take the matter otherwise than it's meant, Captain MacMorris, peradventure i shall think you do not use me with that affability as in discretion you ought to use me look you being as good a man as yourself both in the disciplines of war and in the derivation of my birth and in other particularities i do not know you so good a man as myself so christ save me i will cut off your head gentlemen both you will mistake each other ah oh, that's a foul fault a parley sounded. The town sounds a parley. Captain MacMorris, when there is more better opportunity to be required, look you, I will be so bold as to tell you I know the disciplines of war, and there's an end. Exeunt. Scene three. The same. Before the gates. The governor and some citizens on the walls, the English forces below. Enter King Henry and his train. How yet resolves the governor of the town? This is the latest par we will admit. Therefore to our best mercy give yourselves. Or, like to men proud of destruction, defy us to our worst. For, as I am a soldier, a name that in my thoughts becomes me best, if I begin the battery once again, I will not leave the half-achieved half-fleur till in her ashes she lie buried. The gates of mercy shall be all shut up, and the fleshed soldier, rough and hard of heart, in liberty of bloody hand shall rage with conscience wide as hell, mowing like grass your fresh fair virgins and your flowering infants. What is it then to me if impious war, arrayed in flames like to the prince of fiends, do, with his smirched complexion, all fell feats in linked to waste and desolation? What is't to me? When you yourselves are cause, if your pure maidens fall into the hand of hot and forcing violation, what rain can hold licentious wickedness when down the hill he holds his fierce career? We may as bootless spend our vain command upon the enraged soldiers in their spoil, as send precepts to the leviathan to come ashore. Therefore, you men of Harfleur, take pity of your town and of your people, Whilst yet my soldiers are in my command, whilst yet the cool and temperate wind of grace or blows the filthy and contagious clouds of heady murder, spoil, and villainy, if not, why, in a moment, look to see the blind and bloody soldier with foul hand defile the locks of your shrill, shrieking daughters, your fathers taken by the silver beards and their most reverend heads dashed to the walls, your naked infants spitted upon pikes, 
whilst the mad mothers with their howls confused do break the clouds, as did the wives of Jewry at Herod's bloody hunting slaughtermen. What say you? Will you yield and this avoid, or, guilty in defence, be thus destroyed? Our expectations hath this day an end. The Dauphin, whom of succours we entreated, returns us that his powers are not yet ready to raise so great a siege. Therefore, great king, we yield our town and lives to thy soft mercy. Enter our gates, dispose of us and ours, for we no longer are defensible. Open your gates. Come, Uncle Exeter, go you and enter Harfleur. There remain and fortify it strongly against the French. Use mercy to them all. For us, dear uncle, the winter coming on and sickness growing upon our soldiers, we will retire to Calais. Tonight in Harfleur we will be your guest. Tomorrow for the march are we addressed. Flourish. The king and his train enter the town. Scene four. The French king's palace. Enter Catherine and Alice. Alice, tu as été en Angleterre et tu parles bien le langage. Un peu, madame. Je te prie, m'enseigner. Il faut que j'apprenne à parler. Comment t'appelez-vous la main en anglois La main Elle est appelée « de hand ».« De hand ». Et les doigts Les doigts Ma foi, j'oublie les doigts, mais je me souviendrai. Les doigts Je pense qu'ils sont appelés « de finger ». Oui, « de finger ». La main « de hand », les doigts « de finger ». Je pense que je suis le bon écolier. J'ai gagné deux mots d'anglois vitement. Comment appelez-vous les ongles Les ongles Nous les appelons « de nails ». The nails. Écoutez, dites-moi si je parle bien. The hand, the finger et the nails. C'est bien dit, madame. Il est fort bon anglois. Dites-moi l'anglois pour le bras. The arm, madame. Et le coude The elbow. The elbow. Je m'en fais la répétition de tous les mots que vous m'avez appris jusqu'à présent. Il est trop difficile, madame, comme je pense. Excusez-moi, Alice. Écoutez. De hand, de finger, de nails, de arma, de bilbo. De elbow, madame. Oh, Seigneur Dieu, je m'en oublie. De elbow. Comment appelez-vous le col De neck, madame. De nick. Et le menton De chin. De sin. Le col de nick, le menton de sin. Oui, sauf votre honneur, en vérité. Vous prononcez les mots aussi droit que les natifs d'Angleterre. Je ne doute point d'apprendre par la grâce de Dieu et en peu de temps. N'avez-vous pas déjà oublié ce que je vous ai enseigné Non, je réciterai à vous promptement. De hand, de finger, de mails, de nails, madame. De nails, de arm, de elbow, sauf votre honneur, de elbow. Ainsi dis-je, de elbow, de nick et de sin. Comment appelez-vous le pied et la robe de foot, madame, et de coon. De foot et de coon Oh, Seigneur Dieu Ce sont mots de son mauvais, corruptibles, gros et impudiques, et non pour les dames d'honneur d'user. Je ne voudrais prononcer ces mots devant les seigneurs de France pour tout le monde. Oh, le foot et le coon Néanmoins, je réciterai une autre fois ma leçon ensemble. De hand, de finger, de nails, de arm, de elbow, de nick, de sin, de foot, de coon. Excellent, madame. C'est assez pour une fois. Allons-nous à dîner. Exeunt. Scene five. The same. Enter the king of France, the dauphin, the duke of Bourbon, the constable of France, and others. Tis certain he hath passed the river Somme. And if he be not fought with all, my lord, let us not live in France. Let us quit all, and give our vineyards to a barbarous people. O oh, Dieu vivant, shall a few sprays of us, the emptying of our father's luxury, our science, put in wild and savage stock, spurred up so suddenly into the clouds, and overlook their crafters? Normans, but bastard Normans, Norman bastards, mort de la vie! If they march along and fought with all, but I will sell my dukedom to buy a slobbery and a dirty farm in that nook shot an isle of Albion. Dieu de Bataille, where have they this metal? 
is not their climate foggy raw and dull on whom as in despite the sun looks pale killing their fruit with frowns can sodden water a drench for serene jades their barley broth decoct their cold blood to such valiant heat and shall our quick blood spirited with wine seem frosty oh for honour of our land let us not hang like roping icicles upon our houses thatch whiles a more frosty people sweat drops of gallant youth in our rich fields poor we may call them in their native lords by faith and honour our madams mock at us and plainly say our metal is spread out and they will give their bodies to the lust of english youth to new store friends with bastard warriors they bid us to the english dancing schools and teach la volta's high and swift carantos seeing our grace is only now heels and that we are most lofty runaways where is montjoy the herald speed him hence let him greet england with our sharp defiance up princes and with spirit of honour edged more sharp within your swords high to the field shard la breath high constable of france you dukes of orleans bourbon and of berry alencon brabant bar and burgundy jacques chatillon rambourg vaudemont beaumont grand pre roussy and Falkenberg. Foire, Lestral, Boussiquel, and Charlois, High dukes, great princes, barons, lords, and knights, For your great seats now quit you of great shames. Bar Harry England that sweeps through our land With pennons painted in the blood of Harfleur. Rush on his host as doth the melted snow upon the valleys, Whose low vassal seat the Alps doth spit and void his room upon. Go down upon him, you have power enough, And in a captive chariot into Rouen, Bring him our prisoner. This becomes the great sorry am i his numbers are so few his soldiers sick and famished in their march for i'm sure when he shall see our army he'll drop his heart into the sink of fear and for achievement offer us his ransom therefore lord constable haste on montjoy and let him say to england that we send to know what willing ransom he will give prince dauphin you shall stay with us in rouen not so i do beseech your majesty be patient for you shall remain with us now forth lord constable and princes all and quickly bring us word of england's fall exeunt scene six the english camp in picardy enter gower and fluellen meeting how now captain fluellen come you from the bridge i assure you there is very excellent services committed at the bridge is the duke of exeter safe the duke of exeter is as magnanimous as agamemnon and a man that i love and honour with my soul and my heart and my duty and my life and my living and my uttermost power he is not god be praised and blessed any hurt in the world but keeps the bridge most valiantly with excellent discipline <laughs> there is an ancient lieutenant there at the bridge i think in my very conscience he is as valiant a man as mark antony <laughs> and he is a man of no estimation in the world but did see him do as gallant service what do you call him <clears throat> he is called ancient pistol i know him not enter pistol here is the man captain i thee beseech to do me favours the duke of exeter doth love thee well ay i praise god and i have merited some love at his hands bardolph a soldier firm and sound of art and a buxom valour hath by cruel fate and giddy fortune's furious fickle wheel that goddess blind that stands upon the rolling restless stone by your patience ancient pistol fortune is painted blind with a muffler afore her eyes to signify to you that fortune is blind and she is painted also with a wheel to signify to you which is the moral of it that she is turning and inconstant and mutability and variation and her foot look you is fixed upon a spherical stone 
which rolls and rolls and rolls in good truth the poet makes a most excellent description of it fortune is an excellent moral fortune is badolf's foe and frowns on him for he hath stolen a pax and hanged must i be a damned death let gallows gape for dog let man go free and not let hemp his windpipe suffocate but exeter hath given the doom of death for packs of little price therefore go speak the duke will hear thy voice and let not bardolph's vital thread be cut with edge of penny cord and vile reproach speak captain for his life and i will thee requite ancient pistol i do partly understand your meaning why then rejoice therefore certainly ancient it is not a thing to rejoice at oh, for if look you he were my brother i would desire the duke to use his good pleasure and put him to execution for discipline ought to be used it die and be damned and figo for thy friendship it is well the fig of spain exit very good why this is an arrant counterfeit rascal i remember him now a bod a cut-purse i'll assure you i uttered as brave words at the bridge as you shall see in a summer's day but it is very well what he has spoke to me that is well i warrant you when time is serve why tis a gull a fool a rogue that now and then goes to the wars to grace himself at his return into london under the form of a soldier and such fellows are perfect in the great commander's names and they will learn you by rote where services were done at such and such a sconce at such a breach at such a convoy who came off bravely who was shot who disgraced what terms the enemy stood on and this they con perfectly in the phrase of war which they trick up with new tuned oaths and what a beard of the general's cut and a horrid suit of the camp will do among foaming bottles and ale-washed wits is wonderful to be thought on but you must learn to know such slanders of the age or else you may be marvellously mistook i tell you what captain gower i do perceive he is not the man that he would gladly make show to the world he is if i find a hole in his coat i will tell him my mind drum heard hark you the king is coming and i must speak with him from the bridge drum and colours enter king henry gloucester and soldiers god bless your majesty how now fluellen camest thou from the bridge ay so please your majesty the duke of exeter has very gallantly maintained the bridge the french is gone off look you and there is gallant and most brave passages marry the adversary was have possession of the bridge but he is enforced to retire and the duke of exeter is master of the bridge i can tell your majesty the duke is a brave man what men have you lost fluellen the perdition of the adversary hath been very great reasonable great marry for my part i think the duke hath lost never a man but one that is likely to be executed for robbing a church one bardolf if your majesty know the man his face is all bubucles and whelks and knobs and flames of fire and his lips blows at his nose and it is like a coal of fire sometimes blue and sometimes red but his nose is executed and his fire's out <laughs> we would have all such offenders so cut off and we give express charge that in our marches through the country there be nothing compelled from the villages nothing taken but paid for none of the french upbraided or abused in disdainful language for when lenity and cruelty play for a kingdom the gentler gamester is the soonest winner tucket enter montjoy you know me by my habit well then i know thee what shall i know of thee my master's mind unfold it thus says my king say thou to harry of england though we seemed dead we did but sleep advantage is a better soldier than rashness 
tell him we could have rebuked him at half-law but that we thought not good to bruise an injury till it were full ripe now we speak upon our cue and our voice is imperial england shall repent his folly see his weakness and admire our sufferance bid him therefore consider of his ransom which must proportion the losses we have borne the subjects we have lost the disgrace we have digested which in wait to re-answer his pettiness would bow under for our losses his exchequer is too poor for the effusion of our blood the muster of his kingdom too faint a number and for our disgrace his own person kneeling at our feet but a weak and worthless satisfaction to this add defiance and tell him for conclusion he hath betrayed his followers whose condemnation is pronounced so far my king and master so much my office what is thy name i know thy quality montjoy thou dost thy office fairly turn thee back and tell thy king i do not seek him now but could be willing to march on to calais without impeachment for to say the sooth though tis no wisdom to confess so much unto an enemy of craft and vantage my people are with sickness much enfeebled my numbers lessened and those few i have almost no better than so many french who when they were in health i tell thee herald i thought upon one pair of english legs did march three frenchmen yet forgive me god that i do brag thus this your heir of france hath blown that vice in me i must repent go therefore tell thy master here i am my ransom is this frail and worthless trunk my army but a weak and sickly guard yet god before tell him we will come on though france himself and such another neighbour stand in our way there's for thy labour montjoy go bid thy master well advise himself if we may pass we will if we be hindered we shall your tawny ground with your red blood discolour and so montjoy fare you well the sum of all our answer is but this we would not seek a battle as we are nor as we are we say we will not shun it so tell your master i shall deliver so thanks to your highness exit i hope they will not come upon us now we are in god's hands brother not in theirs march to the bridge it now draws toward night beyond the river we'll encamp ourselves and on to-morrow bid them march away exeunt scene seven the french camp near agincourt enter the constable of france the lord rambouris orleans dauphin with others Tut, i have the best armour of the world would it were day you have an excellent armour but let my horse have his due it is the best horse of europe will it never be morning my lord of orleans and my lord high constable you talk of horse and armour you are as well provided of both as any prince in the world what a long night is this i will not change my horse with any that treats but on four pastons sa ha he bounds from the earth as if his entrails were hairs le cheval volant the pegasus chez les narines de feu when i bestride him i saw i am a hawk he trots the air the earth sings when he touches it the basest horn of his hoof is more musical than the pipe of hermes he's of the colour of the nutmeg and of the heat of the ginger it is a beast for perseus he is pure air and fire and the dull elements of earth and water never appear in him but only in patient stillness while his rider mounts him he is indeed a horse and all other jades you may call beasts indeed my lord it is a most absolute and excellent horse it is the prince of palfreys his neigh is like the bidding of a monarch and his countenance enforces homage no more cousin nay the man hath no wit that cannot from the rising of the lark to the lodging of the lamb very deserved praise on my palfrey it is a theme as fluent as the sea turn the sands into eloquent tongues and my horse is argument for them all tis a subject for a sovereign to reason on and for a sovereign's sovereign to ride on and for the world familiar to us and unknown to lay apart their particular functions and wonder at him i once read a sonnet in his praise and began thus wonder of nature 
I have heard a sonnet begin so to one's mistress. Then did they imitate that which I composed to my corsa, for my horse is my mistress. Your mistress bears well. Me well, which is the prescript praise and perfection of a good and particular mistress. Nay, for me thought yesterday your mistress shrewdly shook your back. So perhaps did yours. Mine was not bridled. Oh, then be like she was old and gentle, and you rode like a kern of Ireland, your French hose off, and in your straight strasses. You have good judgment in horsemanship. Be warned by me, then. They that ride so and ride not warily fall into foul bogs. I had rather have my horse to my mistress. I had as lief have my mistress a jade. I tell thee, constable, my mistress wears his own hair. I could make as true a boast as that if I had a sow to my mistress. Le chien est retourné à son propre vomissement, et la truie lavée au bourbier. Thou makest use of anything. Yet do I not use my horse for my mistress, or any such proverb so little kin to the purpose? My lord constable, the armour that I saw in your tent to-night, are those stars or suns upon it? Stars, my lord? Some of them will fall to-morrow, I hope. And yet my sky shall not want. That may be, for you bear a many superfluously, and were more honour somewhere away. Even as your horse bears your praises, who would trot as well, were some of your brags dismounted? Would I were able to load him with his desert? Will it never be day? I will trot to-morrow a mile, and my way shall be paved with English faces. I will not say so, for fear I should be faced out of my way. But I would it were morning, for I would fain be about the ears of the English. Who will go to hazard with me for twenty prisoners? You must first go yourself to hazard ere you have them. Tis midnight. I'll go on myself. Exit. The Dauphin longs for morning. He longs to eat the English. I think he will eat all he kills. By the white hand of my lady, he's a gallant prince. Swear by her foot that she may tread out the oath. He is simply the most active gentleman of France. Doing his activity, and he will still be doing. He never did harm that I heard of. Nor will do none to-morrow. He will keep that good name still. I know him to be valiant. I was told that by one that knows him better than you. What's he? Mary. He told me so himself, and he said he cared not to knew it. He needs not. It is no hidden virtue in him. By my faith, sir, but it is. Never anybody saw it but his lackey. Tis a hooded valour, and when it appears it will bait. Ill will never said well. I will cap that proverb with, there is flattery in friendship. And I will take that up with, give the devil his due. Well placed. There stands your friend for the devil. Have at the very eye of that proverb with, a pox of the devil. You are the better at proverbs. By how much? A fool's bolt is soon shot. You have shot over. Tis not the first time you were overshot. Enter a messenger. My lord high constable, the English lie within fifteen hundred paces of your tents. Who hath measured the ground? The lord grand prey. A valiant and most expert gentleman. Would it were day. Alas, poor Harry of England, he longs not for the dawning as we do. What a wretched and peevish fellow is this king of England, to mope with his fat-brained followers so far out of his knowledge. If the English had any apprehension, they would run away. That they lack, for if their heads had any intellectual armor, they could never wear such heavy headpieces. That island of England breeds very valiant creatures. Their mastiffs are of unmatchable courage. Foolish curs, that run winking into the mouth of a Russian bear and have their heads crushed like rotten apples. You may as well say, that's a valiant flea that dare eat his breakfast on the lip of a lion. Just, just, and the men do sympathize with the mastiffs in robustious and rough coming on, leaving their wits with their wives, and then give them great meals of beef and iron and steel. They will eat like wolves and fight like devils. Aye, but these English are shrewdly out of beef. Then shall we find to-morrow they have only stomachs to eat and none to fight. Now is it time to arm. 
Come, shall we be about it? It is now two o'clock. But, let me see, by ten we shall have each a hundred Englishmen. Exeunt. End of Act Three. Act Four. Prologue. Enter Chorus. Now entertain conjecture of a time when creeping murmur and the pouring dark fills the wide vessel of the universe. From camp to camp, through the foul womb of night, the hum of either army stilly sounds, that the fixed sentinels almost receive the secret whispers of each other's watch. Fire answers fire, and through their paly flames each battle sees the other's umbered face. Steed threatens steed, in high and boastful neighs piercing the night's dull ear, and from the tents the armourers, accomplishing the knights with busy hammers closing rivets up, give dreadful note of preparation. The country cocks do crow, the clocks do toll, and the third hour of drowsy morning name. Proud of their numbers and secure in soul, the confident and over-lusty French do the low-rated English play at dice, and chide the cripple, tardy gated knight, who like a foul and ugly witch doth limp so tediously away. The poor condemned English, like sacrifices, by their watchful fires sit patiently and inly ruminate the morning's danger and their gesture sad investing lank lean, cheeks and war-worn coats presenteth them unto the gazing moon, so many horrid ghosts. O oh, now, who will behold the royal captain of this ruined band, walking from watch to watch, from tent to tent, let him cry, praise and glory on his head. For forth he goes and visits all his host bids them good morrow with a modest smile, and calls them brothers, friends, and countrymen. Upon his royal face there is no note how dread an army hath enrounded him, nor doth he dedicate one jot of colour unto the weary and all-watched night, but freshly looks and overbears the taint with cheerful semblance and sweet majesty, that every wretch, pining and pale before, beholding him plucks comfort from his looks, a largesse universal like the sun his liberal eye doth give to every one, thawing cold fear, that mean and gentle all, behold as may unworthiness define, a little touch of Harry in the night. And so our scene must to the battle fly, where, oh, for pity, we shall much disgrace with four or five most vile and ragged foils, right ill-disposed in brawl ridiculous, the name of Agincourt. Yet sit and see, minding true things by what their mockeries be. Exit Scene One, The English Camp at Agincourt Enter King Henry, Bedford, and Gloucester Gloucester, tis true that we are in great danger. The greater, therefore, should our courage be. Good morrow, brother Bedford. God Almighty, there is some soul of goodness in things evil, would men observingly distill it out. For our bad neighbour makes us early stirrers, which is both healthful and good husbandry. Besides, they are our outward consciences, and preachers to us all, admonishing that we should dress us fairly for our end, Thus may we gather honey from the weed, and make a moral of the devil himself. Enter Erpingham. Good morrow, old Sir Thomas Erpingham. A good soft pillow for that good white head were better than a churlish turf of France. Not so, my liege. This lodging likes me better, since I may say now I lie like a king. Tis good for men to love their present pains upon example. So the spirit is eased. And when the mind is quickened, out of doubt, the organs, though defunct and dead before, break up their drowsy grave and newly move with casted slough and fresh legerity. Lend me thy cloak, Sir Thomas. Brothers both, commend me to the princes in our camp. Do my good morrow to them, and anon desire them and to my pavilion. We shall, my liege. Shall I attend your grace? No, my good knight. Go with my brothers to my lords of England. 
I and my bosom must debate a while, and then I would no other company. The Lord in heaven bless thee, noble Harry. Exeunt all but King Henry. God a mercy, old heart. Thou speaks cheerfully. Enter Pistol. Qui va la? A friend. Discuss unto me. Art thou officer? Or art thou base, common and popular? I am a gentleman of a company. Trailest thou the puissant pike? Even so. What are you? As good a gentleman as the emperor. Then you are a better than the king. The king's a boarcock and a art of gold, a lad of life, a imp of fame, of parents good, of fist most valiant. I kiss his dirty shoe, and from the heart-string I love the lovely bully. What is thy name? Harry Leroy. Leroy, a Cornish name. Art thou of Cornish crew? No, I am a Welshman. Dost thou Fluellen? Yes. Tell him, I'll knock his leek about his pate upon St. Davy's day. Do not you wear your dagger in your cap that day, lest he knock that about yours. Art thou his friend? And his kinsman too. The fee go for thee, then. I thank you. God be with you. My name is Pistol Cold. Exit. It sorts well with your fierceness. Enter Fluellen and Gower. Captain Fluellen. Shh, so, in the name of Jesu Christ, speak lower. It is the greatest admiration of the universal world when the true and ancient prerogatives and laws of the wars is not kept. If you would take the pains but to examine the wars of Pompey the Great, you shall find, I warrant you, that there is no tittle-tottle nor pibble-pabble in Pompey's camp. I warrant you, you shall find the ceremonies of the wars, and the cares of it, and the forms of it, and the sobriety of it, and the modesty of it, to be otherwise. Why, the enemy is loud, you hear him all night. If the enemy is an ass, and a fool, and a prating coxcomb, is it meet, think you? that we should also look you be an ass and a fool and a prating coxcomb in your conscience now i will speak lower i pray you and beseech you that you will exeunt gower and fluellen though it appear a little out of fashion there is much care and valour in this welshman enter three soldiers john bates alexander court and michael williams brother john bates is not that the morning which breaks yonder i think it be but we have no great cause to desire the approach of day. We see yonder the beginning of the day, but I think we shall never see the end of it. Who goes there? A friend. Under what captain serve you? Under Sir Thomas Erpingham. A good old commander, and a most kind gentleman. I pray you, what thinks he of our estate? Even as men wrecked upon a sand that look to be washed off the next tide. He hath not told his thought to the king? No, nor it is not meet he should. For though I speak it to you, I think the king is but a man as I am. The violet smells to him as it doth to me, the element shows to him as it doth to me. All his senses have but human conditions. His ceremonies laid by, in his nakedness he appears but a man. And though his affections are higher mounted than ours, yet, when they stoop, they stoop with the like wing. Therefore, when he sees reason of fears as we do, his fears out of doubt be of the same relish as ours are. Yet in reason no man should possess him with any appearance of fear, lest he, by showing it, should dishearten his army. He may show what outward courage he will, but I believe, as cold a night as tis, he could wish himself in Thames up to the neck, and so I would he were, and I by him, by all adventures, so we were quit here. By my troth I will speak my conscience of the king, I think he would not wish himself anywhere but where he is. Then I would he were here alone, so should he be sure to be ransomed, and a many poor men's lives saved. I dare say you love him not so ill to wish him here alone. Howsoever you speak this to feel other men's minds, methinks I could not die anywhere so contented as in the king's company, his cause being just and his quarrel honourable. That's more than we know. Aye, or more than we should seek after. For we know enough, if we know we are the king's subjects. If his cause be wrong, our obedience to the king wipes the crime of it out of us. But if the cause be not good, 
The king himself hath a heavy reckoning to make. When all his legs and arms and heads chopped off in battle shall join together at the latter day and cry all, We died at such a place. Some swearing, some crying for a surgeon, some upon their wives left poor behind them, some upon the debts they owe, some upon their children rawly left. I am afeard there are few die well that die in a battle, for how can they charitably dispose of anything when blood is their argument? Now if these men do not die well, it will be a black matter for the king that led them to it, whom to disobey were against all proportion of subjection. So if a son that is by his father sent about merchandise do sinfully miscarry upon the sea, the imputation of his wickedness by your rule should be imposed upon his father that sent him, or if a servant under his master's command, transporting a sum of money, be assailed by robbers and die in many irreconciled iniquities, you may call the business of the master the author of the servant's damnation. But this is not so. The king is not bound to answer the particular endings of his soldiers, the father of his son, nor the master of his servant, for they purpose not their death when they purpose their services. Besides, there is no king, be his cause never so spotless, if it come to the arbitrament of swords, can try it out with all unspotted soldiers. Some peradventure have on them the guilt of premeditated and contrived murder, some of beguiling virgins with the broken seals of perjury, some, making the wars their bulwark, that have before gored the gentle bosom of peace with pillage and robbery. Now if these men have defeated the law and outrun native punishment, though they can outstrip men, they have no wings to fly from God. War is his beadle, war is vengeance, so that here men are punished for before breach of the king's laws in now the king's quarrel. Where they feared the death they have borne life away, and where they would be safe they perish. Then if they die unprovided, no more is the king guilty of their damnation than he was before guilty of those impieties for the which they are now visited. Every subject's duty is the king's, but every subject's soul is his own. Therefore should every soldier in the wars do as every sick man in his bed, wash every moat out of his conscience, and dying so, death is to him advantage, or not dying, the time was blessedly lost wherein such preparation was gained. And in him that escapes it were not sin to think that, making God so free an offer, he let him outlive that day to see his greatness, and to teach others how they should prepare. Tis certain, every man that dies ill, the ill upon his own head, the king is not to answer it. But I do not desire he should answer for me, and yet I determined to fight lustily for him. I myself heard the king say he would not be ransomed. Ay, he said so to make us fight cheerfully. But when our throats are cut, he may be ransomed, and we ne'er the wiser. If I live to see it, I will never trust his word after. You pay him, then. That's a perilous shot out of an elder gun, that a poor and private displeasure can do against a monarch. He may as well go about to turn the sun to ice, with fanning in his face with a peacock's feather. You'll never trust his word after. Come, tis a foolish saying. Your reproof is something too round. I should be angry with you if the time were convenient. Let it be a quarrel between us, if you live. I embrace it. How shall I know thee again? Give me any gage of thine, and I will wear it in my bonnet. Then, if ever thou darest acknowledge it, I will make it my quarrel. Here's my glove. Give me another of thine. There. This will I also wear in my cap. If ever thou come to me and say, after tomorrow, this is my glove, by this hand I will take thee a box on the ear. If ever I live to see it, I will challenge it. Thou darest as well be hanged. Well, I will do it, though I take thee in the king's company. Keep thy word. Fare thee well. Be friends, you English fools, be friends. We have French quarrels enow, if you could tell how to reckon. Indeed, the French may lay twenty French crowns to one, they will beat us, for they bear them on their shoulders. But it is no English treason to cut French crowns, and to-morrow the king himself will be a clipper. Exeunt soldiers. Upon the king. Let us our lives, our souls, our debts, our careful wives, our children, and our sins lay on the king. We must bear all. O hard condition, twin-born with greatness, 
subject to the breath of every fool whose sense no more can feel but his own ringing. What infinite heart's ease must kings neglect that private men enjoy? And what have kings that privates have not too, save ceremony, save general ceremony? And what art thou, thou idle ceremony? What kind of god art thou that sufferest more of mortal griefs than do thy worshippers? What are thy rents? What are thy comings in? O ceremony, show me but thy worth. What is thy soul of adoration? Art thou aught else but place, degree, and form, creating awe and fear in other men? Wherein thou art less happy being feared than they in fearing? What drinks thou oft, instead of homage sweet but poisoned flattery? O be sick, great greatness, and bid thy ceremony give thee cure. Think'st thou the fiery fever will go out with titles blown from adulation? Will it give place to flexure and low bending? Canst thou, when thou commandst the beggar's knee, command the health of it? No, thou proud dream, that place so subtly with a king's repose. I am a king that find thee, and I know tis not the balm, the sceptre and the ball, the sword, the mace, the crown imperial, the intertissued robe of gold and pearl, the farced title running for the king, the throne he sits on, nor the tide of pomp that beats upon the high shore of this world. No, not all these thrice gorgeous ceremony, not all these laid in bed majestical can sleep so soundly as the wretched slave, who with a body filled and vacant mind gets him to rest, crammed with distressful bread. Never sees horrid night the child of hell, but like a lackey, from the rise to set, sweats in the eye of Phoebus, and all night sleeps in Elysium. Next day after dawn doth rise and help Hyperion to his horse, and follows so the ever-running year with profitable labour to his grave. And but for ceremony, such a wretch, winding up days with toil and nights with sleep, had the forehand and vantage of a king. The slave, a member of the country's peace, enjoys it, but in gross brain little wots what watch the king keeps to maintain the peace, whose hours the peasant best advantages. Enter Erpingham. My lord, your nobles, jealous of your absence, seek through your camp to find you. Good old knight, collect them all together at my tent. I'll be before thee. I shall do it, my lord. Exit. O god of battles, steal my soldiers' hearts, Possess them not with fear. Take from them now the sense of reckoning, if the opposed numbers pluck their hearts from them. Not to-day, O oh Lord, O oh not to-day, think not upon the fault my father made encompassing the crown. I, Richard's body, have interred anew, and on it have bestowed more contrite tears than from it issued forced drops of blood. Five hundred poor I have in yearly pay, who twice a day their withered hands hold up toward heaven to pardon blood. And I have built two chantries, where the sad and solemn priests sing still for Richard's soul. More will I do, though all that I can do is nothing worth, since that my penitence comes after all imploring pardon. Enter Gloucester. My liege. My brother Gloucester's voice. Ay, I know thy errand. I will go with thee. The day, my friends, and all things stay for me. Exeunt. Scene two. The French camp. Enter the Dauphin, Orléans, Rambouret, and others. The sun doth gild our armor. Up, my lords. Montez à cheval, my horse, varlet, laquais. Ah! O brave spirit. Viens, les eaux et la terre. Rien puis, le air et le feu. Ciel, cousin Orléans. Enter Constable. Now, my Lord Constable. Hark, how our steeds for present service nigh. Mount them and make incision in their heights, that their hot blood may spin in English eyes and doubt them with a superfluous courage. Ha! What, will you have them weep our horses' blood? How shall we then behold their natural tears? Enter Messenger. The English are embattled, you French peers. To horse, your gallant princes, straight to horse. 
do but behold yon poor and starved band and your fair show shall suck away their souls leaving them but the shales and husks of men there is not work enough for all our hands scarce blood enough in all their sickly veins to give each naked curtelax a stain that our french gallant shall to-day draw out and sheath for lack of sport let us but blow on them the vapour of our valour will overturn them tis positive gainst all exceptions lords that our superfluous lackeys and our peasants who in unnecessary action swarm about our squares of battle were enow to purge this field of such a hilding foe though we upon this mountain's basis by took stand for idle speculation but that our honours must not what's to say a very little little let us do and all is done then let the trumpets sound the tucket sonance and the note to mount for our approach shall so much dare the field that england shall couch down in fear and yield enter grand pre why do you stay so long my lords of france yon island carrions desperate of their bones ill-favouredly become the morning field their ragged curtains poorly are let loose and our air shakes them passing scornfully big mar seems bankrupt in their beggared host and faintly through a rusty beaver peeps the horsemen sit like fixed candlesticks with torch staves in their hand and their poor jades lob down their heads dropping the hides and hips the gum down roping from their pale dead eyes and in their pale dull mouths the gimmel bit lies foul with chewed grass still and motionless and their executors the knavish crows fly o'er them all impatient for their hour description cannot suit itself in words to demonstrate the life of such a battle in life so lifeless as it shows itself they have said their prayers and they stay for death shall we go send them dinners and fresh suits and give their fasting horses provender and after fight with them i stay but for my guidon to the field i will the banner from a trumpet take and use it for my haste come come away the sun is high and we outwear the day exeunt scene three the english camp enter gloucester bedford exeter erpingham with all his host salisbury and westmoreland where is the king the king himself is rode to view their battle of fighting men they have full three score thousand there's five to one besides they are all fresh god's arm strike with us tis a fearful odds god be with you princes all all to my charge if we no more meet till we meet in heaven then joyfully my noble lord of bedford my dear lord gloucester and my good lord exeter and my kind kinsman what is all adieu farewell good salisbury and good luck go with thee farewell kind lord fight valiantly to-day and yet i do thee wrong to mind thee of it for thou art framed of the firm truth of valour exit salisbury he is full of valour as of kindness princely in both enter the king oh that we had now here but one ten thousand of those men in england that do no work to-day what's he that wishes so my cousin westmoreland no my fair cousin if we are marked to die we are enow to do our country loss and if to live the fewer men the greater share of honour god's will i pray thee wish not one man more by jove i am not covetous for gold nor care i who doth feed upon my cost it yearns me not if men my garments wear such outward things dwell not in my desires but if it be a sin to covet honour i am the most offending soul alive no faith my cause wish not a man from england god's peace i would not lose so great an honour as one man more methinks would share for me for the best hope i have o oh, do not wish one more rather proclaim it westmoreland through my host that he which hath no stomach to this fight let him depart his passport shall be made and crowns for convoy put into his purse we would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us this day is called the feast of crispian 
he that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when the day is named and rouse him at the name of crispian he that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbours and say to-morrow is saint crispian then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say these wounds i had on crispin's day old men forget yet all shall be forgot but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day then shall our names familiar in his mouth as household words harry the king bedford and exeter warwick and talbot salisbury and gloucester be in their flowing cups freshly remembered this story shall the good man teach his son and crispin crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world but we in it shall be remembered we few we happy few we band of brothers for he to-day that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother be he ne'er so vile this day shall gentle his condition and gentlemen in england now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap whilst any speaks that fought with us upon saint crispin's day re-enter salisbury my sovereign lord bestow yourself with speed the french are bravely in their battle set and will with all expedience charge upon us all things are ready if our minds be so perish the man whose mind is backward now thou dost not wish more help from england cuz god's will my liege would you and i alone without more help could fight this royal battle why now thou hast unwished five thousand men which likes me better than to wish us one you know your places god be with you all tucket enter montjoy once more i come to know of thee king harry if for thy ransom thou wilt now compound before thy most assured overthrow for certainly thou art so near the gulf thou needs must be in glutted besides in mercy the constable desires thee thou wilt mind thy followers of repentance that their souls may make a peaceful and a sweet retire from off these fields where wretches their poor bodies must lie and fester who hath sent thee now the constable of france i pray thee bear my former answer back bid them achieve me and then sell my bones good god why should they mock poor fellows thus the man that once did sell the lion's skin while the beast lived was killed with hunting him a many of our bodies shall no doubt find native graves upon the which i trust shall witness live in brass of this day's work and those that leave their valiant bones in france dying like men though buried in your dung hills they shall be famed for there the sun shall greet them and draw their honours reeking up to heaven leaving their earthly parts to choke your clime the smell whereof shall breed a plague in france mark then abounding valour in our english that being dead like to the bullets grazing break out into a second course of mischief killing in relapse of mortality let me speak proudly tell the constable we are but warriors for the working day our gayness and our guilt are all besmirched with rainy marching in the painful field there's not a piece of feather in our host good argument i hope we will not fly and time hath worn us into slovenry but by the mass our hearts are in the trim and my poor soldiers tell me yet ere night they'll be in fresher robes or they will pluck the gay new coats or the french soldiers heads and turn them out of service if they do this as if god please they shall my ransom then will soon be levied herald save thou thy labour come thou no more for ransom gentle herald they shall have none i swear but these my joints which if they have as i will leave em then shall yield them little tell the constable i shall king harry and so fare thee well thou never shalt hear herald any more exit i fear thou'lt once more come again for ransom enter york my lord most humbly on my knee i beg the leading of the varward take it brave york now soldiers march away and how thou pleasest god dispose the day exeunt scene four 
the field of battle. Alarum, excursions, enter pistol, French soldier, and boy. Ye old cur. Je pense que vous êtes gentilhomme de bonne qualité. Qualité calmier casture may. Art thou a gentleman? What is thy name? Discuss. Oh, Seigneur Dieu. Oh, Seigneur Dieu should be a gentleman. Per pen my words, O oh, Seigneur Dieu, and mark. O oh, Seigneur Dieu, thou diest on point of fox, except, O oh, Seigneur, thou do give to me a grievous ransom. Oh, prenez miséricorde, ayez pitié de moi. Moi shall not serve. I will have forty moys, or I will fetch thy rim out at thy throat in drops of crimson blood. Est-il impossible d'échapper la force de ton bras? Brass, cur. Thou damned and luxurious mountain goat, offerest me brass? Oh, pardonnez-moi. Sayest thou me so? Is that a ton of moys? Come hither, boy. Ask me this slave in French, what is his name? Écoutez, comment êtes-vous appelé? Monsieur Le Fer. He says his name is Master Fer. Master Fer. I'll fur him and furk him and ferret him. Discuss the same in French under him. I do not know the French for fair, and ferret, and furk. Bid him prepare, for I will cut his throat. Que dit-il, monsieur? Il me commande de vous dire que vous faites vous prêt, car ce soldat ici est disposé tout à cette heure de couper votre gorge. Eh oui, capolai gorge, permafoy. Peasant, unless thou give me crowns, brave crowns, or mangled shalt thou be by this my sword. Oh, je vous supplie, pour l'amour de Dieu, me pardonnez. Je suis gentilhomme de bonne maison. Gardez ma vie, et je vous donnerai deux cents écus. What are his words? He prays you to save his life. He is a gentleman at a good house. And, for his ransom, he will give you two hundred crowns. Tell him my fury shall abate, and I the crowns will take. Petit monsieur, que dit-il encore qu'il est contre son jurement de pardonner aucun prisonnier, néanmoins, pour les écus que vous l'avez promis, il est content de vous donner la liberté, le franchissement. Sur mes genoux, je vous donne mille remerciements, et je m'estime heureux que je suis tombé entre les mains d'un chevalier, je pense, le plus brave, vaillant et très distingué seigneur d'Angleterre. Expand unto me, boy. He gives you a pen is near, a thousand thanks and he esteemed himself happy that he has fallen into the hand of one, as he thinks, the most brave, valorous, and thrice-worthy signor of England. As I suck blood, I will some mercy show. Follow me. Suivez-vous le grand capitaine. Exeunt pistol and French soldier. I did never know so full of voice issue from so empty an heart. But the thing is true. The empty vessel makes the greatest sound. Bottles and nim at ten times more value than this roaring devil. He has held play that every one may pur his nails with a wooden dagger, and they are both ended. And so will this be, if he durst steal anything adventurously. I must say with the lackeys, with the luggage of our camp, the French might have a good prey of us, if he knew of it, or there is none to guard it but by. Exit. Scene 5. Another part of the field. Enter Constable, Orléans, Bourbon, Dauphin, and Rambour. Oh, diable! Oh, seigneur, le jour est perdu, tout est perdu. Mort de ma vie, all is confounded all. Reproach and everlasting shame sits mocking in our plumes. O oh, méchant fortune, do not run away. A short alarm. Why, all our ranks are broke. O oh, perdurable shame, let's stab ourselves. Be these the wretches that we played at dice for? Is this the king we sent to for his ransom? Shame, an eternal shame, nothing but shame. Let us die in honour. Once more back again, and he that will not follow Bourbon now, let him go hence, and with his cap in hand, like a base pander, hold the chamber door whilst by a slave, 
no gentler than my dog his fairest daughter is contaminated disorder that hath spoiled us friend us now let us on heaps go offer up our lives we are enow yet living in the field to smother up the english in our throngs if any order might be thought upon the devil take order now out to the throng let life be short else shame will be too long exeunt scene six another part of the field alarms enter king henry and forces exeter and others well have we done thrice valiant countrymen but all's not done yet keep the french the field the duke of york commends him to your majesty lives he good uncle thrice within this hour i saw him down thrice up again in fighting from helmet to the spur all blood he was in which array brave soldier doth he lie larding the plain and by his bloody side yoke fellow to his honour owing wounds the noble earl of suffolk also lies suffolk first died and york all haggled over comes to him wherein gore he lay in steeped and takes him by the beard kisses the gashes that bloodily did spawn upon his face and cries aloud tarry dear cousin suffolk my soul shall thine keep company to heaven tarry sweet soul for mine then fly abreast as in this glorious and well-foughten field we kept together in our chivalry upon these words i came and cheered him up he smiled me in the face wrought me his hand and with a feeble gripe says dear my lord commend my service to me sovereign so did he turn and over suffolk's neck he threw his wounded arm and kissed his lips and so espoused to death with blood he sealed a testament of noble ending love the pretty and sweet manner of it forced those waters from me which i would have stopped but i had not so much of man in me and all my mother came into my eyes and gave me up to tears i blame you not for hearing this i must perforce compound with mistful eyes or they will issue too alarum but hark what new alarum is this same the french have reinforced their scattered men then every soldier kill his prisoners give the word through Exeunt. Scene seven. Another part of the field. Enter Fluellen and Gower. Do you kill the boys and the luggage. Tis expressly against the law of arms. Tis as arrant a piece of knavery, mark you now, as can be offered. In your conscience now, is it not? Tis certain there's not a boy left alive, and the cowardly rascals that ran from the battle had done this slaughter besides they have burned and carried away all that was in the king's tent wherefore the king most worthily hath caused every soldier to cut his prisoner's throat oh tis a gallant king ay he was born at monmouth captain gower what call you the town's name where alexander the pig was born alexander the great why i pray you is not pig great the pig or the great or the mighty or the huge or the magnanimous are all one reckoning save the phrase is a little variations i think alexander the great was born in macedon his father was called philip of macedon as i take it i think it is in macedon where alexander is born i tell you captain if you look in the maps of the world i warrant you shall find in the comparisons between macedon and monmouth that the situations look you is both alike there is a river in macedon and there is also moreover a river at monmouth it is called Y at monmouth but it is out of my brains what is the name of the other river but tis all one tis alike as my fingers is to my fingers and there is summons in both <laughs> if you mark alexander's life well harry of monmouth's life is come after it indifferent well for there is figures in all things alexander god knows and you know in his rages and his furies and his wraths 
and his colours and his moods and his displeasures and his indignations and also being a little intoxicates in his brains did in his ales and his angers look you kill his best friend clytus our king is not like him in that he never killed any of his friends it is not well done mark you now take the tales out of my mouth ere it is made and finish it i speak but in the figures and comparisons of it as alexander killed his friend clytus being in his ales and his cups so also harry monmouth being in his right wits and his good judgments turned away the fat knight with the great belly doublet he was full of jests and jipes and knaveries and mocks i have forgot his name sir john falstaff that is he i'll tell you there is good men porn at monmouth here comes his majesty alarum enter king henry and forces warwick gloucester exeter and others i was not angry since i came to france until this instant take a trumpet herald ride thou into the horsemen on yon hill if they will fight with us bid them come down avoid the field they do offend our sight if they'll do neither we will come to them and make them scur away as swift as stones enforced from the old assyrian slings besides we'll cut the throats of those we have and not a man of them that we shall take shall taste our mercy go and tell them so enter montjoy here comes the herald of the french my liege his eyes are humbler than they used to be how now what means this herald knowst thou not that i have fined these bones of mine for ransom comest thou again for ransom no great king i come to thee for charitable license that we may wander all this bloody field to look our dead and then to bury them to sort our nobles from our common men for many of our princes woe the while lie drowned and soaked in mercenary blood so do our vulgar drench their peasant limbs in blood of princes and their wounded steeds fret fetlock deep in gore and with wild rage yerk out their armed heels at their dead masters killing them twice o oh, give us leave great king to view the field in safety and dispose of their dead bodies i tell thee truly herald i know not if the day be ours or no for yet a many of your horsemen peer and gallop o'er the field the day is yours praised be god and not our strength for it what is this castle called that stands hard by they call it agincourt then call we this the field of agincourt fought on the day of crispin crispianus you are grandfather of famous memory and please your majesty and your great uncle edward the black prince of wales as i have read in the chronicles fought a most brave battle here in france they did fluellen your majesty says very true if your majesty is remembered of it the welshmen did good service in a garden where leeks did grow wearing leeks in their monmouth caps which your majesty know to this hour is an honourable badge of the service and i do believe your majesty takes no scorn to wear the leek upon st tavy's day i wear it for a memorable honour for i am welsh you know good countryman all the water in why cannot wash your majesty's welsh blood out of your body i can tell you that god bless it and preserve it as long as it pleases his grace and his majesty too thanks good my countryman by jesu i am your majesty's countryman i care not who know it i will confess it to all the world i need not to be ashamed of your majesty praise it be god so long as your majesty is an honest man god keep me so our heralds go with him bring me just notice of the numbers dead on both our parts call yonder fellow hither points to williams exeunt heralds with montjoy soldier you must come to the king soldier why wearest thou that glove in thy cap and please your majesty tis the gage of one that i should fight withal if he be alive an englishman and please your majesty a rascal that swaggered with me last night who if alive and ever dare to challenge this glove i have sworn to take him a box of the ear 
or if I can see my glove in his cap, which he swore as he was a soldier he would wear for life, I will strike it out soundly. What think you, Captain Fluellen? Is it fit this soldier keep his oath? He is a craven and a villain else, and please your majesty in my conscience. It may be his enemy is a gentleman of great sort, quite from the answer of his degree. Though he be as good a gentleman as the devil is, as Lucifer and Belzebub himself, it is necessary, look your grace, that he keep his vow and his oath. If he be perjured, see you now, his reputation is as arrant a villain and a jack sauce as ever his black shoe trod upon God's ground and his earth in my conscience. La. Then keep that vow, sirrah, when thou meetest the fellow. So I will, my liege, as I live. Who servest thou under? Under Captain Gower, my liege. Gower is a good captain, and is good knowledge and literature in the wars. Call him hither to me, soldier. I will, my liege. Exit. Here, Fluellen, wear thou this favour for me, and stick it in thy cap. When Alanson and myself were down together, I plucked this glove from his helm. If any man challenge this, he is a friend to Alanson and an enemy to our person. If thou encounter any such, apprehend him, and thou dost me love. Your grace does me as great honours as can be desired in the hearts of his subjects. I would fain see the man that has but two legs that shall find himself aggrieved at this glove. That is all. But I would fain see it once, and please God of his grace that I might see. Knowest thou Gower? He is my dear friend, and please you. Pray thee, go seek him, and bring him to my tent. I will fetch him. Exit. My lord of Warwick, and my brother Gloucester, follow Fluellen closely at the heels. The glove which I have given him for a favour may happily purchase him a box of the ear. It is the soldier's. I, by bargain, should wear it myself. Follow, good cousin Warwick. If that the soldier strike him, as I judge by his blunt bearing he will keep his word, some sudden mischief may arise of it. For I do know Fluellen valiant, and, touched with collar, hot as gunpowder, and quickly will return an injury. Follow, and see there be no harm between them. Go you with me, uncle of Exeter. Exeunt. Scene 8. Before King Henry's Pavilion. Enter Gower and Williams. I warn it is to night you, Captain. Enter Fluellen. God's will and his pleasure, Captain, I beseech you now, come apace to the king. There is more good toward you, peradventure, than is in your knowledge to dream of. Sir, know you this glove? Know the glove? I know the glove is glove. I know this, and thus I challenge it. Strikes him. Oh. Oh. Splud, an arrant traitor as any in the universal world, or in France, or in England. How now, sir, you villain? Do you think I'll be forsworn? Stand away, Captain Gower. I will give treason his payment into ploughs, I warrant you. I am no traitor. That's a lie in thy throat. I charge you in his majesty's name. Apprehend him. He's a friend of the Duke Alanson's. Enter Warwick and Gloucester. How now? How now? What's the matter? My lord of Warwick, here is, praise it be God for it, a most contagious treason come to light, look you, as you shall desire in a summer's day. Oh, here's his majesty. Enter King Henry and Exeter. How now? What's the matter? My liege, here is a villain and a traitor that, look your grace, has struck the glove which your majesty is take out of the helmet of Alanson. My liege, this was my glove. Here is the fellow of it. And he that I gave it to in change promised to wear it in his cap. I promised to strike him if he did. I met this man with my glove in his cap, and I have been as good as my word. Your majesty here now, save in your majesty's manhood, what an arrant, rascally, beggarly, lousy knave it is. I hope your majesty is bear me testimony and witness, and will avouchment that this is the glove of Alanson that your majesty is give me, in your conscience now. Give me thy glove, soldier. Look, here is the fellow of it. 
"'Twas I, indeed, thou promisedst to strike, "'and thou hast given me most bitter terms. "'And please your majesty, let his neck answer for it, "'if there is any martial law in the world. "'How canst thou make me satisfaction? "'All offences, my lord, come from the heart. "'Never came any from mine that might offend your majesty. "'It was ourself thou didst abuse. "'Your majesty came not like yourself. "'You appeared to me but as a common man.' witness the night your garments your lowliness and what your highness suffered under that shape i beseech you take it for your own fault and not mine for had you been as i took you for i made no offence therefore i beseech your highness pardon me here uncle exeter fill this glove with crowns and give it to this fellow keep it fellow and wear it for an honour in thy cap till i do challenge it give him the crowns and captain you must needs be friends with him by this day and this light the fellow has metal enough in his belly <laughs> hold there is twelve pence for you and i pray you to serve god and keep you out of prawls and prabbles and quarrels and dissensions and i warrant you it is the better for you i will none of your money it is with a good will i can tell you it will serve to mend your shoes come wherefore should you be so pashful your shoes is not so good <laughs> tis a good ceiling i warrant you or i will change it enter an english herald now herald are the dead numbered here is the number of the slaughtered french what prisoners of good sort are taken uncle charles duke of orleans nephew to the king john duke of bourbon and lord boucicault of other lords and barons knights and squires full fifteen hundred besides common men this note doth tell me of ten thousand french that in the fields lie slain of princes in this number and nobles bearing banners there lie dead one hundred twenty-six added to these of knights esquires and gallant gentlemen eight thousand and four hundred of the which five hundred were but yesterday dubbed knights. So that, in these ten thousand they have lost, there are but sixteen hundred mercenaries. The rest are princes, barons, lords, knights, squires, and gentlemen of blood and quality. The names of those their nobles that lie dead, Charles Delabreth, High Constable of France, Jacques of Chatillon, Admiral of France, the master of the crossbows, Lord Rambours, great master of France, the brave Sir Guisha Dauphin, John, Duke of Alençon, Anthony, Duke of Brabant, the brother of the Duke of Burgundy, and Edward, Duke of Bar, of lusty earls, Grand Pré and Roussy, Fossenberg and Foix, Beaumont and Marle, Vaudemont and Lestral. Here was a royal fellowship of death. Where is the number of our English dead? Edward, the Duke of York, the Earl of Suffolk, Sir Richard Ketley, Davy Gam, Esquire. None else of name, and of all other men but five and twenty. O oh God, thy arm was here, and not to us, but to thy arm alone ascribe we all. When, without stratagem, but in plain shock and even play of battle, was ever known so great and little loss on one part and on the other. Take it, God, for it is none but thine. Tis wonderful. Come, go we in procession to the village. And be it death proclaimed through our host to boast of this, or take the praise from God which is his only. Is it not lawful, and please your majesty, to tell how many is killed? Yes, captain, but with this acknowledgment, that God fought for us. Yes, my conscience, he did us great good. Do we all holy rites? Let there be sung non nobis and te deum, the dead with charity enclosed in clay, and then to Calais, and to England then, where ne'er from France arrived more happy men. Exeunt. End of Act Four. Act Five. Prologue. Enter Chorus. Vouchsafe to those that have not read the story, that I may prompt them. 
and of such as have, I humbly pray them to admit the excuse of time, of numbers, and due course of things, which cannot in their huge and proper life be here presented. Now we bear the king toward Calais. Grant him there, there seen, heave him away upon your winged thoughts athwart the sea. Behold, the English beach pales in the flood with men, with wives and boys, whose shouts and claps outvoice the deep-mouthed sea, which, like a mighty whiffler for the king, seems to prepare his way. So let him land, and solemnly see him set on to London. So swift a pace hath thought that even now you may imagine him upon Blackheath, where that his lords desire him to have borne his bruised helmet and his bended sword before him through the city. He forbids it, being free from vainness and self-glorious pride, giving full trophy, signal, and ostent quite from himself to God. But now, behold, in the quick forge and working house of thought, how London doth pour out her citizens! The mayor and all his brethren, in best sort, like to the senators of the antique Rome, with the plebeians swarming at their heels, go forth and fetch their conquering Caesar in. As, by a lower but loving likelihood, were now the general of our gracious empress, as in good time he may, from Ireland coming, bringing rebellion broached on his sword, how many would the peaceful city quit to welcome him! Much more! and much more cause did they this harry. Now in London place him, as yet the lamentation of the French invites the King of England's stay at home, the Emperor's coming in behalf of France, to order peace between them, and omit all the occurrences, whatever chanced, till Harry's back return again to France. There must we bring him, and myself have played the interim by remembering you tis past. Then brook abridgment, and your eyes advance, after your thoughts, straight back again to France. Exit Scene One, France, the English camp. Enter Fluellen and Gower. Nay, that's right. But why wear you your leek to-day? St. Davy's day is past. Tew, there is occasions and causes, why and wherefore, in all things. I will tell you, as my friend Captain Gower, the rascally, scald, beggarly, lousy, pragging knave, Pistol, which you and yourself and all the world know to be no better than a fellow, look you now, of no merits. He is come to me and brings me bread and salt yesterday, look you, and bid me eat my leek. It was in place where I could not breed no contention with him, but I will be so bold as to wear it in my cap till I see him once again, and then I will tell him a little piece of my desires. Enter Pistol. Why, here he comes, swelling like a turkey cock. Tis no matter for his swellings, nor his turkey cocks. God bless you, ancient pistol, you scurvy, lousy knave. God bless you. Ah, art thou bedlam? Dost thou thirst, base Trojan, to have me fold up Parker's fatal web? Hence, I am qualmish at the smell of leek. I beseech you heartily, scurvy, lousy knave, at my desires, and my requests, and my petitions, to eat, look you, this leek because look you you do not love it nor your affections and your appetites and your digestions do not agree with it i would desire you to eat it not for cadwallader and all his goats there is one goat for you <coughs> will you be so good scald knave as eat it by strojan thou shalt die you say very true scald knave when god's will is i will desire you to live in the meantime and eat your victuals come there is <coughs> sauce for it <coughs> <coughs> you call it me yesterday mountain squire but i will make you to-day a squire of low degree i pray you fall to if you can mock a leek you can eat a leek. 
enough captain you have astonished him i say i will make him eat some part of my leek or i will peat his pate four days bite i pray you it is good for your green wound and your bloody coxcomb <laughs> must i boy yes certainly and out of doubt and out of question too and ambiguities by his leek i will make horribly revenge i i swear eat i pray you will you have some more sauce to your leek there is not enough leek to swear by quite like hamsels there are three i eat much good do you scald knave heartily nay pray you throw none away the skin is good for your broken coxcomb <gasps> when you take occasions to see leeks hereafter i pray you mock at them that is all <laughs> good ay leeks is good hold you there is a groat to heal your pate <laughs> me a groat yes verily and in truth you shall take it or i have another leek in my pocket which you shall eat i take thy groat in earnest of revenge if i owe you anything i will pay you in cudgels you shall be a woodmonger and buy nothing of me but cudgels god be with you and keep you and heal your pit <laughs> exit all hell shall stir for this go go you are a counterfeit cowardly knave will you mock at an ancient tradition begun upon an honourable respect and worn as a memorable trophy of predeceased valour and dare not avouch in your deeds any of your words i have seen you gleeking and galling at this gentleman twice or thrice you thought because he could not speak english in the native garb he could not therefore handle an english cudgel you find it otherwise and henceforth let a welsh correction teach you a good english condition fare ye well exit does fortune play the huswife with me now news have i that my nell is dead in the spittle of the malady of france and there my rendezvous is quite cut off old do i wax and from my weary limbs honour is cudgelled well board i'll turn and something lean to cuppers of quick hand to england will i steal and there i'll steal and patches will i get unto these cudgelled scars and swear i got them in the gallia wars <laughs> exit scene two france a royal palace enter at one door king henry exeter bedford gloucester warwick westmoreland and other lords at another the french king queen isabel the princess catherine alice and other ladies the duke of burgundy and his train peace to this meeting wherefore we are met unto our brother france and to our sister health and fair time of day joy and good wishes to our most fair and princely cousin catherine and as a branch and member of this royalty by whom this great assembly is contrived we do salute you duke of burgundy and princes french and peers health to you all right joyous are we to behold your face most worthy brother england fairly met so are you princes english every one so happy be the issue brother england of this good day and of this gracious meeting as we are now glad to behold your eyes your eyes, which hitherto have borne in them against the French, they met them in their bent, the fatal balls of murdering basilisks. The venoms of such looks we fairly hope have lost their quality, and that this day shall change all griefs and quarrels into love. To cry amen to that, thus we appear. You English princes all, I do salute you. My duty to you both, on equal love, great kings of France and England that i have laboured with all my wits my pains and strong endeavours to bring your most imperial majesties unto this bar and royal interview 
your mightiness on both parts best can witness. Since then my office hath so far prevailed that, face to face, and royal eye to eye, you have concreted, let it not disgrace me, if I demand, before this royal view, what rub or what impediment there is, why that the naked, poor, and mangled peace, dear nurse of arts and joyful births, should not in this best garden of the world, our fertile France, put up her lovely visage. Alas, she hath from France too long been chased, and all her husbandry doth lie in heaps, corrupting in its own fertility. Her vine, the merry cheerer of the heart, unpruned dies, her hedges, even pleached, like prisoners widely overgrown with hair, put forth disordered twigs. Her fallow lees, the darnel, hemlock, and rank fumatory doth root upon, while that the quarter rusts that should deracinate such savagery. The even maid, that erst brought sweetly forth the freckled cowslip, burnet and green clover, wanting the scythe, all uncorrected, rank, conceives by idleness, and nothing teems but hateful docks, rough thistles, texies, burrs, losing both beauty and utility. And as our vineyards, fallows, meads, and hedges, defective in their natures, grow to wildness, even so our houses and ourselves and children have lost or do not learn for want of time the sciences that should become our country, but grow like savages, as soldiers will that nothing do but meditate on blood, to swearing and stern looks, to fused attire, and everything that seems unnatural, which to reduce into our former favour you are assembled, and my speech entreats that I may know the let, while gentle peace should not expel these inconveniences and bless us with her former qualities. If, Duke of Burgundy, you would the peace, whose want gives growth to the imperfections which you have cited, you must buy that peace with full accord to all our just demands, whose tenors and particular effects you have enscheduled briefly in your hands. The king hath heard them, to the which, as yet, there is no answer made. Well, then, the peace which you before so urged lies in his answer. I have but with a cursory eye or glance the articles. Pleaseth your grace to appoint some of your council presently to sit with us once more? With better heed to re-survey them, we will suddenly pass our accept and peremptory answer. Brother, we shall. Go, Uncle Exeter, and Brother Clarence, and you, Brother Gloucester. Warwick and Huntington, go with the king, and take with you free power to ratify, augment or alter, as your wisdom's best shall see advantageable for our dignity, anything in or out of our demands, and we'll consign thereto. Will you, fair sister, go with the princes, or stay here with us? Our gracious brother, I will go with them. Haply a woman's voice may do some good when articles too nicely urged be stood on. Yet leave our cousin Catherine here with us. She is our capital demand comprised within the full rank of our articles. She hath good leave. Exeunt all except Henry, Catherine, and Alice. Fair Catherine, and most fair, will you vouchsafe to teach a soldier terms such as will enter at a lady's ear, and plead his love-suit to her gentle heart? Your majesty shall mock at me. I cannot speak your England. O oh, fair Catherine, if you will love me soundly with your French heart, I will be glad to hear you confess it brokenly with your English tongue. Do you like me, Kate? Pardonnez-moi, I cannot tell what is like me. An angel is like you, Kate, and you are like an angel. Que dit-il? Que je suis semblable à les anges? Oui, vraiment, sauf votre grâce. Ainsi dit-il. I said so, dear Catherine, and I must not blush to affirm it. Oh, bon Dieu, les langues des hommes sont pleines de tromperies. What says she, fair one, that the tongues of men are full of deceits? We, oui, that the tongue of the man is be full of deceits, that is, the princess. The princess is the better Englishwoman. If faith, Kate, my wooing is fit for thy understanding. I am glad thou canst speak no better English, for if thou couldst thou wouldst find me such a plain king, that thou wouldst think I had sold my farm to buy my crown. I know no ways to mince it in love, but directly to say I love you. 
then if you urge me farther than to say do you in faith i wear out my suit give me your answer if faith do and so clap hands in a bargain how say you lady so votre honneur me understand well marry if you would put me to verses or to dance for your sake kate why you undid me for the one i have neither words nor measure and for the other i have no strength in measure yet a reasonable measure in strength if i could win a lady at leapfrog or by vaulting into my saddle with my armour on my back under the correction of bragging be it spoken i should quickly leap into a wife or if i might buffet for my love or bound my horse for her favours i could lay on like a butcher and sit like a jack and apes never off but before god kate i cannot look greenly nor gasp out my eloquence nor have i no cunning in protestation only downright oaths which i never use till urged nor never break for urging if thou canst love a fellow of this temper kate whose face is not worth sunburning that never looks in his glass for love of anything he sees there let thine eye be thy cook i speak to thee plain soldier if thou canst love me for this take me if not to say to thee that i shall die is true but for thy love by the lord no yet i love thee too and while thou livest dear kate take a fellow of plain and uncoined constancy for he perforce must do thee right because he hath not the gift to woo in other places for these fellows of infinite tongue that can rhyme themselves into ladies favours they do always reason themselves out again what a speaker is but a prater a rhyme is but a ballad a good leg will fall a straight back will stoop a black beard will turn white a curled pate will grow bald a fair face will wither a full eye will wax hollow but a good heart kate is the sun and the moon or rather the sun and not the moon for it shines bright and never changes but keeps his course truly if thou would have such a one take me and take me take a soldier take a soldier take a king and what sayest thou then to my love speak my fair and fairly i pray thee is it possible that i should love the enemy of france no it is not possible you should love the enemy of france kate but in loving me you should love the friend of france for i love france so well that i will not part with a village of it i will have it all mine and kate when france is mine and i am yours then yours is france and you are mine i cannot tell what is that no kate i will tell thee in french which i am sure will hang about my tongue like a new-married wife about her husband's neck hardly to be shook off je compte sur la possession de france et quand vous avez la possession de moi let me see what then saint denis be my speed donc votre est france et vous êtes mienne it is as easy for me kate to conquer the kingdom as to speak so much more french i shall never move thee in french unless it be to laugh at me sauf votre honneur le françois que vous parlez il est meilleur que l'anglois lequel je parle no faith is not kate but thy speaking of my tongue and i thine most truly falsely must needs be granted to be much at one but kate dost thou understand thus much english canst thou love me i cannot tell can any of your neighbours tell kate i'll ask them come i know thou lovest me and at night when you come into your closet you will question this gentlewoman about me and i know kate you will to her dispraise those parts in me that you love with your heart but good kate mock me mercifully the rather gentle princess because i love thee cruelly if ever thou beest mine kate as i have a saving faith within me tells me thou shalt i get thee with scambling and thou must therefore needs prove a good soldier breeder shall not thou and i between saint denis and st george compound a boy half french half english that shall go to constantinople and take the turk by the beard shall we not what sayest thou my fair flower de luce i do not know that no tis hereafter to know but now to promise do but now promise kate you will endeavour for your french part of such a boy and for my english moiety take the word of a king and a bachelor 
how answer you la plus belle catherine du monde mon très cher et devin déesse your majesty a false french enough to deceive the most sage demoiselle that is in france now fie upon my false french by mine honour in true english i love thee kate by which honour i dare not swear thou lovest me yet my blood begins to flatter me that thou dost notwithstanding the poor and untempering effect of my visage now beshrew my father's ambition he was thinking of civil wars when he got me therefore was i created with a stubborn outside with an aspect of iron that when i come to woo ladies i fright them but in faith kate the elder i wax the better i shall appear my comfort is that old age that ill layer up of beauty can do no more spoil upon my face thou hast me if thou hast me at the worst and thou shalt wear me if thou wear me better and better and therefore tell me most fair catherine will you have me put off your maiden blushes avouch the thoughts of your heart with the looks of an empress take me by the hand and say harry of england i am thine which word thou shalt no sooner bless mine ear withal but i will tell thee aloud england is thine ireland is thine france is thine and harry plantagenet is thine who though i speak it before his face if he be not fellow with the best king thou shalt find the best king of good fellows come your answer in broken music for thy voice is music and thy english broken therefore queen of all catherine break thy mind to me in broken english wilt thou have me that is as it shall please the roi mon père nay it will please him well kate it shall please him kate then it shall also content me upon that i kiss your hand and i call you my queen laissez mon seigneur laissez laissez ma foi je ne veux point que vous abaissiez votre grandeur en baisant la main d'une de votre seigneurie indigne serviteur excusez-moi je vous supplie mon très puissant seigneur then i will kiss your lips kate les dames et demoiselles pour être baisées devant leurs noces il n'est pas la coutume de france madame my interpreter what says she that it is not be the fashion pour les ladies of france i cannot tell what is baisé in english to kiss your majesty entendre better que moi it is not a fashion for the maids in france to kiss before they are married would she say oui vraiment oh kate nice customs curtsy to great kings dear kate you and i cannot be confined within the weak list of a country's fashion we are the makers of manners kate and the liberty that follows our places stops the mouth of all fine faults as i will do yours for upholding the nice fashion of your country and denying me a kiss therefore patiently and yielding kissing her you have witchcraft in your lips kate there is more eloquence in a sugar touch of them than in the tongues of the french council and they should sooner persuade harry of england than a general petition of monarchs here comes your father re-enter the french king and his queen burgundy and other lords god save your majesty my royal cousin teach you our princess english i would have her learn my fair cousin how perfectly i love her and that is good english is she not apt our tongue is rough cuz and my condition is not smooth so that having neither the voice nor the heart of flattery about me i cannot so conjure up the spirit of love in her that he will appear in his true likeness <laughs> pardon the frankness of my mirth if i answer you for that if you would conjure in her you must make a circle if conjure up love in her in his true likeness he must appear naked and blind can you blame her then being a maid yet roast over with the virgin crimson of modesty if she deny the appearance of a naked blind boy in her naked seeing self it were my lord a hard condition for a maid to consign to yet they do wink and yield as love is blind and enforces they are then excused my lord when they see not what they do then good my lord teach your cousin to consent winking i will wink on her to consent my lord if you will teach her to know my meaning for maids well summered and warm kept are like flies at bartholomew tide 
blind, though they have their eyes, and then they will endure a handling which before would not abide looking on. This moral tides me over to time and a hot summer, and so I shall catch the fly your cousin in the latter end, and she must be blind too. As love is, my lord, before it loves. It is so, and you may, some of you, thank love for my blindness, who cannot see many a fair French city for one fair French maid that stands in my way. Yes, my lord, you see them perspectively. The city's turned into a maid, for they are all girdled with maiden walls that war hath ne'er entered. Shall Kate be my wife? So please you? I am content. So the maiden cities you talk of may wait on her. So the maid that stood in the way for my wish shall show me the way to my will. We have consented to all terms of reason. Is't so, my lords of England? The king hath granted every article, his daughter first, and then, in sequel, all, according to their firm proposed natures. Only he hath not yet subscribed this, where your majesty demands, that the king of France, having any occasion to write for matter of grant, shall name your highness in this form, and with this addition in French, Notre très chef fils Henri, roi de l'Angleterre, héritier de France, and thus in Latin, Praeclarissimus filius noster Henricus, rex Angliae et hires Franciae. Nor this I have not, brother, so denied, but our request shall make me let it pass. I pray you then, in love and dear alliance, let that one article rank with the rest, and thereupon give me your daughter. Take her, fair son, and from her blood raise up issue to me, that the contending kingdoms of France and England, whose very shores look pale with envy of each other's happiness, may cease their hatred and this dear conjunction plant neighbourhood and Christian-like accord in their sweet bosoms, that never war advance his bleeding sword twixt England and fair France. Amen. Amen. Now welcome, Kate, and bear me witness all that here I kiss her as my sovereign queen. Flourish. God, the best maker of all marriages, combine your hearts in one, your realms in one. As man and wife, being two, are one in love. So be there twixt your kingdom such espousal That never may ill office or fell jealousy, Which troubles oft the bed of blessed marriage, Thrust in between the paction of these kingdoms To make divorce of their incorporate league, That English may as French, French Englishmen, receive each other. God speak this Amen. 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 Prepare we for our marriage. On which day, my lord of Burgundy, we'll take your oath, and all the peers for surety of our leagues. Then shall I swear to Kate, and you to me, and may our oaths well kept and prosperous be. Senate. Exeunt. Epilogue. Enter Chorus. Thus far, with rough and all unable pen, our bending author hath pursued the story, in little room confining mighty men, Mangling by starts the full course of their glory. Small time, but in that small most greatly lived this star of England. Fortune made his sword, by which the world's best garden he achieved, And of it left his son imperial lord, Henry the Sixth, in infant bands crowned king of france and england did this king succeed whose state so many had the managing that they lost france and made his england bleed which oft our stage hath shown and for their sake in your fair minds let this acceptance take exit end of act five end of henry v by William Shakespeare.